all on this academic activity. Uh, without wasting any time, I'll call uh, Duba for recitation of Holy Quran. JNC UK Alumni Seminar and the theme or topic of this seminar is education and for proper proceeding I invite uh, our worthy Vice Chancellor Professor Khalid Masood Kondal on stage. <coughs> For HAMC UK Chair, I invite Dr. Farda Tari Shabhi. He is General Secretary of HAMC UK Alumni and currently working as occupation health physician. I think, and we observed the timing. Our sharp nine o'clock. Our objective to start the day. So, my welcome address. You all have been here, and I will request all the chair to come on the stage. And now I request the stage secretary or the moderated. I think moderated may. So I request you to invite the first speaker. Thank you. Now I invite the first speaker of today's proceeding is Dr. Temur Tariq Shafi. He is currently serving as medical registrar of King's College Hospital NHS Foundation, okay? and uh, he is RCP Associate College Member and NHS England appointed lead leadership fellow. <laughs> Dr. Temur.
Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much for inviting me to such an illustrious university to be able to share some knowledge with everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Timur Shafi. Um, I'll go into a bit of an introduction in a minute. But the, the basis of my talk today is uh, rapidly establishing yourself as a desirable UK trainee. Now, we have a lot of medical students in attendance, and I'm sure a few junior doctors as well, uh, some of whom may well be considering coming to the UK, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. I speech. So, um, just a little bit about myself. So, I have multiple appointments in the United Kingdom. Um, so, I am the NHS England and the Health Education England lead for leadership training for medical doctors in London and the Southeast region. Um, I'm also in charge of the internal medical trainees at King's College Hospital and the Princess Royal University Hospital uh, and look, overlooking their medical education needs. And I also have an appointment with um, the Royal College of Physicians as Associate College Tutor. So a lot of my work actually is in leadership, developing leaders, uh, medical education, and of course a degree of mentorship as well. Um, the basis of my talk will go into leadership, medical education as well, but um, I'll do that in tandem with talking about establishing yourself as a UK trainee. Now the first thing is, why do I want to why, why, why am I giving this talk today? What, what is the reason for this particular talk? And I, I truly believe here in Pakistan, we have some of the best doctors in the world. And when you're working in the UK and you're working around the world, when you look at clinical competency, competency when you look at intellect, when you look at hard working and, uh, and work ethic as well. But unfortunately what happens a lot of the time is our doctors who come across the UK, a lot of them end up spending quite a few years in non-training posts, or if they do achieve a training post, they don't get their full potential out of it because of external factors that I want to cover today. So to, in a way, sort of help bridge the gap. So this talk, may I'm going to say there's a bit of assumed knowledge. Of course, we have limited time. So I'm going to assume everybody knows that you need to do your PLAB exams. Vakwanch ki English ki exams, you know, they have ki IELTS and OLET exams. ECFMG is the application site. And of course, um, you need to do your observerships and your interview. Essentially, I'm starting from the point where you're ready to start work in the UK. Um, now, obviously, um, Dr. Athirne or the other team from K have an excellent uh, 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 workshop just outside, so they can help with the initial part of things. I'm taking it from when you're ready to work and get moving in the UK. So this is an overall look at the training structure in the UK. Um, uh, this is how the general structure uh, is built. So the first two years are your foundation training years, which are house officer years. And we have two F1 and F2. After that, you go into specialty training. Specialty training, um, depending on what you do, there's two types. You have to have day one, say, you have to for example, fields like radiology, histopathology. But a lot of fields, you have to go gastro, you have to go to cardiology, you do a few years as a general medical trainee, general psychiatric, general surgical training, whatever it is you're doing, and then you go into the training pathway. After which, you I'll give people a minute just to sit down. I think I'll, be, I'll just give people about 30 seconds to sit down. Okay, so like I said, I've just roughly gone over the general structure of the UK training system, and then obviously you're going to consultancy. Jopne note ki over has going off the slide because the next 45 years of your life you're a consultant. So many parts of capacity need to keep the whole thing on one slide. Now the next points, these are the points you have you Jumari uh, Pakistani graduates where they come into the system. Everybody over here has down harsh job by the time they come, so they are post the FY foundation training years up for Kandani birthday. 
So you're either applying for a core training post or to look at the at the time you have to spend here and they've done the MRCS or MRCP, for example, they can go straight into specialty training. Now, ideally, what you want to do is start your training and march on. Like in both of you, unfortunately, with a lot of our Pakistani graduates, because they're not fully aware of the system, is you end up going in circles like this, or you have to be four, four, five years old. And this is the this is the gap I want to bridge, and what I want to talk about today. So the question is, how do we get on that and move forward? So before you can actually apply and before all these things become relevant, the one form you need to fill out that I'm just going to briefly touch on is called your CREST form. Essentially, you, it's a two-side document in which you show you have the equivalency of the German Foundation Training Program. It's basically you have the clinical competencies and they're very basic things. Can you add the catheter? Can you add your empathy? You know how to do research. These are basic things which we will cover in the bigger part of the talk. Once you've done this, you can now establish yourself as a UK training. And the question is, how do we know what makes people attractive on paper? You need to understand the system, and that's what we're going to go through today. You need to understand what the employers are looking for. And this is a really important point, and I say this again and again, we have some of the best doctors in the world, probably the best doctors in the world coming out of Pakistan, who are clinically excellent. But clinical competency in the UK is only about 50% of the journey. There are so many other things, research, quality improvement, audits, leadership, and this will form a big part of my talk as well. I'm sorry, I'm here particularly interested in leadership at those because there's another time spent going uh, And this is just a website on which you can get all of this information as well. Sorry. So these are the seven areas that I want to talk about today. I don't know how well that's projecting, but I will, uh, I'll go through it word by word anyway. So we'll start with the first one, which is commitments to your speciality. Uh, my background is in hepatology, liver, liver transplant, and gastroenterology. But whatever you want to do, apnea, cardiology, apnea, general surgery, apnea, showing a degree of commitment to speciality is important. And there's two things that you will need to show when you're trying to compete for a position. Number one is your what you've done to learn about the speciality. So making sure after your rotations and your apnea, the things that you go in, uh, that you're involved in are specialty specific. For example, cardiology, respiratory medicine, there is no point in spending three, four years in A and E or ERA just because of local care. And sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just sort of um, get, sort of coming straight to the point, but you need to get involved in the topics of interest. And obviously, um, we've talked a little bit about sort of doing rotations, a project specific kind of thing. And you do courses and workshops as well. You should try to arrange your conferences with the, for example, gastroenterology sector, the British Society of Gastroenterologists, and other conferences that are uh, subject specific as well. Now, the first thing is this is how you've uh, taken time to learn about the learn about the topic. How do you display you are a good candidate by showing continued commitment? by showing academic output from what you're doing, research papers, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, and also by s taking initiative to setting up learning events. These are big things that will, that really have a big impact and really uh, push you right forward as, a, uh, as somebody who should be hired. The next thing I want to talk about is your academic side of things. Now, academics are two of general things. One is the publication side of things, and within publication, there's a lot of finessing you need to do. For example, you what type of publication key? Is it original research? Is it a randomized control trial? Is it a systematic review? Or is it something like a case report? So different things have different values. It's important things to know. Authorship may be important, and of course, making sure things are PubMed recognized as well. Presentation, similarly, international, national, or regional level, and whether you give oral or poster presentations, all these things make a difference. And obviously, I put them in rank order, what you ideally want to do. And these are things, the reason I want to put, again, I'm putting these, these are things that our doctors in the UK are aware of, and they end up being a few steps ahead, and we need to bridge that gap. So the next thing we're going to talk about is quality improvement. The quality improvement in sort of what used to be called auditing is becoming a growing and growing thing in the UK and actually we should look to establish the best we can in Pakistan as well. 
So quality improvement is a framework used to improve patient care. You find an evidence-based uh, practice, for example, there's a significant morbidity and mortality once they're discharged into the outpatient setting. How many UK, in my hospital, we set up a discharge bundle. For example, stop smoking advice, the primary rehabilitation, a rescue packs, steroid stuff packs, inhaler stuff packs, and how to use these type of things. We dropped readmission by 30% the next winter. So essentially you find you find something that is a beneficial practice, evidence-based practice. And rather than auditing, the focus of this is using small time points by doing small pieces of data collection and multiple repeated cycles of implementation, implementation. So first cycle, for example, you've talked to an auditorium. Second cycle, you've poster value. So getting involved with QI and making sure you make the most of that as well. <clears throat> Again, from a scoring standpoint and get, making the most out of your uh, of your of your training, um, <coughs> number one, general involvement, and just like anything, when we talked about the publications as well, the quality of what you do, what is the impact of work? Have you done something to eight department men, or are you doing something that affects two or three hospitals? So, a scale of work and uh, and completing the study as well, of course. Next topic is going to be education that you need to cover. And within education, uh, there's two arms of education. Obviously, the first arm is teaching. Ten minutes. So the first part of education is teaching others. And just like anything, you need to think of this as a ladder. <coughs> you start off with small group teaching. After shortly, after bedside teaching, just okay. Then you take students along and you and you see patients. You examine patients with them. You step this up to lecture-based teaching. You can do OSCE jo hamari teaching hoti hai, viva based teaching, jo basis ki teaching hoti hai, jo yahan pe aapki FCPSC part two ki teaching hoti hai. So this is how you step things up. And always, 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 the ultimate and final step is organization of teaching events. And again, this is how you show progression. The second part of education, this is again important because this is the second thing they look for. It's not just about how well are you as a teacher, and this are global coaches and brain, but how much time have you invested in learning yourself as an educator? Apne courses consequent degrees, apne koi additional kiye wo consequent. Getting feedback by senior educators and uh, and keeping that feedback, which is quite a keeping that feedback is important as well. Keeping the evidence is going forward. <coughs> Now, obviously, this is a bit of a topic of interest of mine, so I'll spend a couple of minutes on leadership. So, leadership is another big uh, scoring point that you need to be aware of when we're coming to applications. You need to, as best as you can, take up leadership posts. Now, whether those leadership posts are international, national, regional, or local, it, it, it's, it's all the same. And remember, I always say with leadership, leadership in every institution, it moves upwards. Now, obviously, top examples of leadership is our president who PMA ki, our president who um, of the Royal College of Physicians, something like that. But it doesn't mean that is the only form of leadership. Aap kisi charity kaam mein, you are on a high level. Um, aap NHS approved jobs mein aap kaam kare, that is a high level job. But the key thing over here is understanding, and this is uh, understanding this key point that it just doesn't mean you need to go for the top few of posts to uh, available him. Within your working career, within the hospital, things like being the manager of the rotor for the doctors, this is a huge leadership thing, just to have good advantage point of view of them. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so this is another thing as well. So these are just being aware that there's many avenues and you need to start building things from as a UK trainee from the word go. Now, this is a few points I was going to just talk about leadership, as you know. So, I do a lot of leadership training, both in London and South, London, and South England as well. So, I do have an interest in it. Now, doctors, medical students, junior doctors, senior doctors, you are all leaders by definition of being a doctor. Whether you're leading a cardiac arrest, whether you're leading a ward round, whether you're leading a very complex patient discussion, you are a leader. I do believe, and this is the reason why I'm invested in my work, a lot of issues we have today, whether they be in medical education, whether they be in equal distribution of healthcare, whether they be in good patient care, uh, whether they be in doctor well-being, a lot of these issues can be addressed and managed by better leadership. 
और मैं आपको एक चीज की तसली दे देता हूँ ये लीडरशिप का मसला इज नॉट जस्ट ओवर हियर दिस इज वाई वी डू दिस कोर्स इज अ बिग इशू ऑफ लीडरशिप इन द यूके आई श्योर एवरीबडी ओवर हियर नोज द स्केल ऑफ स्ट्राइक शो हो रहे हैं आजकल देयर इज बिग बिग इश्यूज इन लीडरशिप एंड इट्स अ बिग एरिया स्पेशली बोथ इन द यूके एंड इन पाकिस्तान व्हेन वी कैन मेक एन इंपैक्ट एंड द की थिंग इज नॉट हाउ स्टार्टिंग योरसेल्फ इज एज अ गुड लीडर now this talk i was just saying to one of our colleagues earlier the talk i gave over 16 hours in hr sessions so i'm going to summarize it in 16 seconds the main key points of leadership the first thing is being authentic in yourself jo banda who is not authentic in his leadership he's very transparent and you see right through him and actually that loses faith in the followers as well showing grit and perseverance for a vision things will not go in a straight line open easy cheese and chalti this peaks and this drops but showing you are persevering and you're trying to get your team to that position is an excellent is a fine is another excellent leadership point and then very very important as a leader is not being self interested showing selflessness and showing a keenness to develop those who are part of your team as well and just a quick thing about the difference between leadership and management leadership is all the things i've just talked about building developing your team taking them on a journey to reach that vision as a manager you're looking to tick boxes and this is the issue i'm sure jin room the third who who spent some time in the uk there's managers 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 and actually we need more leaders yeah sorry mera thoda sa leadership wali jo main zaruri tha that i that i enjoyed that i wanted to get out there okay the next point is about awards uh, another thing that makes you a better candidate on paper as well So obviously in your prani medical degree jo aapki MBBS se if you are med- if you are medal or if you if you have a medal ship uh, if you have distinction if you have awards ab isme zare this is your hard work in medical school this may account for it too much so these are things that have big value going forward getting prizing for jo humne prizes for your presentations of karte internationally these things have awards but then also again this is the point that, for example i was making with leadership earlier for teaching just because you've not done for example up a distinction in medical you still can for example apne apne local hospital you've done a lot of teaching you've done a lot of leadership work you get local teaching award you get regional awards ka apne kings mein ek kiya birmingham mein ek kiya and you get a award for that these still count so just being aware of the full scale of things and the final thing is extra qualifications um and this is just because it's it's, it's another thing that you can say you get points on obviously up the mrcp mrcs uh obs- obstetrics mrc psych whatever it is you're doing and then obviously additional teaching degrees i mentioned one point um about as being a teacher it's not just about um <clears throat> teaching others but sort of developing yourself as a leader getting degrees uh, certificates in teaching postgraduate certificates in teaching all these things have a lot of weight and obviously mds phds are at the top of that <coughs> So we've gone through a full seven point plan. I've tried to summarize that. Obviously, it's a 20 minutes talk, so it's not a lot of time. So I've tried to summarize that the best I can in the context of leadership and medical education, how to best establish yourself as a good disciple trainee. And obviously, the ideal thing is we excel in all of these, and as Pakistani graduates, we get to the top positions in the UK, and we make sure we score green on all the different sections. This is the final picture I had. I always like to put something a little bit personal at the end of my presentations. Yehi Nanu. Nanu was from the second batch of FJ who graduated in 1954. Alhamdulillah Nanu alhamdulillah alhamdulillah is well in herself and is in her mid 90s. Ye second this fear is from 48 hours ago. So maine kaha tha ki um sort of some heritage that we have as well from the site so thank you very very much and uh, thank you for ta- taking the time question will be afterwards abhi so we are ke um hum log jo gaate hain first generation pakistani doctors who go and work in britain western countries uh, us unke liye aap kya advice hai ke uh, aam taur pe bahut uh, जितने भी डॉक्टर्स हैं 
The short answer is it's tricky. It's not straightforward to get the top leading post. Maybe as a hundred and a lot of shukri, I'm on an NHS training post. I haven't started working yesterday. I am about, <laughs> I'm about 11 years into what I'm doing to get to where I am. It takes time, it takes perseverance, it takes grit. This is the short answer to things. But the, the, the key thing I want to say is do not be disheartened. I, I am not by any means the president of any major society. Yes, I have visions of where I want to be in five years, and I think having a vision is very important as well. But there's a stepping stone to get there. There's a ladder to get there. Many examples, you know, in the context of when you start working, things like taking responsibilities of the rotor management stuff, there is lots of things you can do at a local level, at a, at a starting level, which build your CV, build you as a character, and make you uh, eligible for those bigger roles as well. Uh, gee, thank you very much. A big round of applause for the work. Uh, we have guest uh, uh, speakers waiting uh, uh, in North America. We have the time zone ke mutabi kafi raat ki deer ho gayi hai, so I just want to get on with the proceedings. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Tahir Darabi. Uh, if we can get into the room, maybe we can talk to him. Uh, in the meanwhile, so the way it's going to work is that uh, we have a recorded. Uh, video uh, we recorded from Tahir. Uh, Tahir is an educationist of uh, world renown. He actually set up the Lums School of Education. Uh, he's currently in California and uh, uh, he teaches there and uh, very high academic qualifications. I think he's uh, uh, an economist by trade and uh, he trained at the MIT. So if you can uh, get to I'm not sure if the is on the screen. I'm not sure if you can protect the screen or the screen. Learning, I really appreciate it. And I see you as a fellow traveler on this journey with Guru Education in Pakistan. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is going two parts. So first is uh, going to be led by me, Ahmed uh, Zarabi, as a professor at Moana College in, in, in California an economist and uh, one of the co-founders of the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan in Lahore. Uh, and I've been working in Pakistan for over two decades, uh, mostly around education and uh, have now a very large group of uh, committed researchers and uh, policy analysts uh, of all ages uh, working on this. So we're going to talk about uh, the LEAPS project, which is the Learning and Educational Achievement in Pakistan and what I call a systems approach to education reform. And uh, what I want to do is, in the short time that I have, is just give you some highlights and uh, a short background. And after that, we will have a chance to have a live Q&A. So, here I go. There's a global education crisis. It's not just Pakistan. Uh, and the crisis is that enrollment is rising all over the world. Uh, the second crisis is the part is the crisis part is that the learning levels are stagnant worldwide. Okay, so enrollment is rising. That's great. Even though we talk about uh, out of school children in Pakistan, but uh, Pakistan now has one of the largest in school children in, Pakistan, in the world, and is increasing at a very rapid pace. Uh, but learning levels are stagnant. And other thing which is a phenomenon, I think it's a global phenomenon, which is that in North American countries, about 28 to 30 percent, in Pakistan it is over 35 percent of kids are in what I would call low cost private schools. So one of the big questions before us is how do we really improve quality of education uh, in this environment? And the reality is that uh, we are not on track. Okay. So this is not Pakistan, this is the United States where I sit. And you can see that over the last uh, you know, 50 years, learning levels are quite stagnant. They don't seem to increase that much. So sh shifting learning levels up is not an easy task. This is particularly important given the amounts of money that have been spent at the global level. The Foundation, uh, SPDO, the UK, the World Bank Group, um, literally billions of dollars have been spent around the world uh, to improve learning. And if you think about it, the amount of technology that has gone up in our life in the last 50 years, uh, from cell phones and iPhones, laptops and, uh, and Zoom and, and all the other types of work, 
uh, learning levels have not, which basically means our productivity in amount of money that we spend and the results that we get is really going down. So this is a real challenge for us, and people who think that there are some easy solutions or some uh, magic bullets uh, have to really uh, uh, wrestle uh, with this data. So the central question that I have basically dedicated my professional research uh, life to, uh, and I think many of us, and I think that uh, you guys are uh, thinking about the same question, is how can we increase learning? And I'm not talking about learning for your children or my children or kids coming from Aitchison or Beacon House or grammar schools of the world uh, or American universities as the people who go to universities. I'm talking about disadvantages, which is the largest chunk actually people in the world. And then the second thing is how do we create effective interventions? And effectiveness has both in terms of achieving what we want, but we also want to think about, about cost. And effective means things that can work at scale, not just things that work in the lab, not just things that work in the theory. So that's the question which I think is central. And I think that one of the things that Heaps has been able to do is to move the discussion from inputs. So inputs means infrastructure. Input means missing facilities, creating boundary walls, creating uh, more toilets, or, or increasing the student-teacher ratio, and things of that sort. Those are what we call in economic models inputs into the education system. So what we want to focus is what we call a systems approach. And the first part of the systems approach is to map the ecosystem. So the ecosystem has schools, it has policymakers, it has parents, it has peers, uh, it has teachers, uh, it has uh, people who provide textbooks, people who provide all kinds of outside the school material from the internet, and in Pakistan's case, also uh, private tuition, all of that stuff is part of the ecosystem. And what we are saying is that unless you place a child whose interests that we are trying to understand, uh, unless you place the child in the middle of this ecosystem and map all of these uh, linkages as you see in the top panel, uh, we will not be able to get a handle on what's going on. The reality is what we use the term called friction. Along all those paths in the ecosystem, whether it is a relationship between the teacher and the child, or within the family, or between the government and the school, there are lots of friction. And these, these relationships, these uh, nodes in the ecosystem, where they interact with each other, that's where it, the problem is. So what you want to do is identify the problem, and then what you want to do is, uh, is try to solve it. And what, what we say is, when we try to solve it, is, is you iterate, you update, uh, you refine. Uh, you won't get it right the first time. And the question is, can this approach work? And I think that what I want to tell you here is that the leaps two decades of work in Pakistan has demonstrated the power of the system's approach. Okay. Let me talk to you about a little bit about the breadth and depth of the leaps portfolio. Uh, 20 years of research, it's 20 plus now, uh, it's the largest body of education research in Pakistan and one of the largest, in fact, I would say one or two. I mean, I, I think there's work going on in India and in certain parts of Africa uh, led by researchers in the United States. But this is by far one of the largest and has become a benchmark and a model uh, in terms of mapping the ecosystem for other places in the world and has been used uh, by, by studying by Oxford or what is called Young Life and the World Bank and, and uh, the Indian census and many other places. I want to here point out that most of the work that I have done is with my two collaborators, my long-term collaborators, Asim Jalal at Harvard Kennedy School, and Jishnu Das, who is uh, currently at, uh, at Georgetown, and many other people, including uh, a generation of Corona students and alums, but uh, uh, so many of us uh, at CERT in Lahore. One of the things that I'm most proud of uh, is the people who have gone through the, the LEAPS project and young people who have worked with us as RAs uh, or as students are uh, now have finished their PhDs and many of them are professors and principal investigators in their own right. So one of the things apart from, uh, apart from the education research itself is to create an ecosystem of researchers. 
uh, create a critical mass of researchers uh, that we need. If you're interested, you can go to our website, which is at the Kennedy School Leaves.hjs.harvard, check this out, and uh, we can talk about that. Okay, so here's the problem of Pakistan in a nutshell. Uh, enrollment, as you can see, over the last 50 years has gone up very dramatically. Uh, enrollment ratios are really high. Uh, there is dropouts, but the number is dwarfed by the increase in enrollment. But at the same time, I have a lot of data on, on testing. And in fact, Malia Ali, my, my, my colleague and collaborator, uh, in the next set of presentation, will talk about one particular uh, intervention that we have done and talk in more detail about it, where we are focused on the learning loss. But this is very difficult. Uh, this is a typical great feature. This is Asad, which is one of these uh, very large testing exercises done all over the world, including in Pakistan. And in math, uh, I have a lot to talk about it. If people want to get question and answer and ask questions, then we have to talk. But the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, in math, numbers are really bad. English, which by the way is a multi subject in Pakistan, uh, is, uh, is, you can see, can read a sentence. Uh, Urdu can read a sentence. So Urdu, Pashto, Sindhi. Uh, this, is, this is really good. Asad has tested and I've done a lot of work in KP and Punjab, so I can talk directly about it. So, high enrollment, kids are in school. So, the first generation battle of getting kids in school, we are working on it, we are seeing progress. However, when we get to learning, uh, things are pretty amazing. And it's not that we haven't done anything about it. This is just a list of reforms. We, we calculated the list of reforms. Uh, passed uh, mostly in Punjab but also nationally and we documented over 85 actual reforms done by the government uh, in the form in education. And it's not that these reforms were just bogus reforms or paper, paper reforms or, or corruption and all that. These were reforms that were actually implemented. So it's not that we are not trying and in fact if you guys put your brains together and all the, the, the brains of the government and Fatma Jinnah and say, hey, why don't we try this in education? And I can tell you, uh, I can come up with somewhere in Pakistan uh, at some time that we have tried it. Okay, so Pakistan is, is really an archaeological dig of You dig and you find something here. Okay, so that's part of the puzzle. Enrollment going up, learning standard, lots of work, not much results. So, okay, so here's something very interesting. Which is when we talk about the system, in Pakistan now you can't just talk about one system, which is government school. So this is a village, we one of the leaps villages, Abaza, as it is called in the Pakistan census, uh, in Atta, uh, it should be A-T-T-O-C-K, uh, my RA, Ms. Uh, and that's the, uh, it's one village, I was there uh, earlier this year, uh, and uh, this is in uh, 2020, uh, January 2023, okay? Uh, and you can see this village, a typical village uh, uh, with uh, two settlements in there and surrounded by fields and all that. And you can see the government schools are on the, the ones in yellow are on the periphery of these settlements and there's a whole history for that, why that is so. Uh, but you see three government schools and one, two, three, four, five, six private schools. Okay, and these are schools which are not uh, like chains or very high-end private schools, these are low-end private schools. Fees between 300, 400, 500 rupees a month, a uh, small mom and pop private school. This is really part of the enrollment expansion in Pakistan. And what it has done, as you can see, that the density of private schooling, uh, the density of schooling has gone up a lot uh, in this village. Uh, what private schools have done is created these kind of liberal schools in which uh, girls, particularly, can walk uh, to a nearby school. This is not just a Pakistan phenomenon. This is all over the world. And in fact, partly motivated by LEAP, India started collecting all this data on it as well. Uh, and we see this uh, in Africa as well. So this I think I want you to keep in mind. This is really much a part of it. Uh, one thing which is really nice and fascinating is that parents are willing to pay and willing to spend. Private and government expenditures of education are really high, even for the poorest people. And parents spend even in government school, they spend on other uh, aspects of uh, a child's education besides fees. So what you can see is private tuition is, 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 is high in most places uh, and all aspects of people. In fact, I would say 
if you adjust for people's income, the willingness to pay of households in Pakistan and their aspirations about Pakistani children are one of the highest in the world. So this is a very, very positive thing. Okay. But many of them are not very informed about their children. Uh, you know, the question is, is do they know what's going on with their children's education? This is one of the big questions. In deep samples, most of the mothers are uh, very less educated. They're not as educated as, uh, you know, about in our sample in the beginning, 70% of the moms are completely illiterate. It's a random sample of religion. So this is the reality that one generation ago, uh, there was very little education. So education in Pakistan is a little bit new phenomenon. So one big question is in a systems approach, how do you really think about parents coming into the education system, particularly the poorest? That's the biggest problem in, uh, if you're coming from a poor family. So what we did is did a major intervention, which we tested every single child in these villages in third grade, and we provided school and child level report cards for all the public and private schools in these 115 villages, uh, and every single third grade. Uh, and uh, we made it public with uh, village meetings, uh, and it became a huge uh, point of conversation uh, with the private schools, and we saw that learning improved, the worst schools closed, enrollment improved, and schools became more affordable. So all good things happen. So this was a no-cost solution, which is through information, you can start raising educational quality. And I'm a member of this Global Education Advisory uh, panel, evidence panel. Uh, and this was called one of the best times, one of the best things. So I think this is something which can be scaled up very much. And I think how can we involve parents to put pressure on schools, to help the children, to know where the children are weak. We are doing a lot more work on it and I can talk about that. Uh, school need funds for investment. Schools are very poorly funded, both private and public schools in Pakistan. Uh, so the question is, we did two interventions. Providing public and, pro public and private sector funds leads to learning aid and all kinds of good things. Uh, but it's very interesting. Um, one of the things that we have highlighted is really the interesting unit is a village. So Pakistan is really the rural areas of Pakistan, a collection of villages. And what we see is there's a lot of intra-village dynamic. And uh, what we found is that when everybody, when schools know that other schools are getting help too, uh, that creates a sense of competition. So what we are saying is use funding to enhance competition, not tackle competition. The second experiment that we did, this is one of the four interesting experiments, which is that everybody worries about private schools and what to do about their quality. Uh, we found that when public schools in a village receive funding, uh, and this was done through very careful monitoring by school councils, uh, parent uh, associations, and with a uh, NGO or National Rural Support Program, uh, when they receive funding, actually learning improves. So when schools get money and they're allowed to spend how they want to spend it, uh, their scores increase, but what is fascinating is that private schools did, in the city village did not get funding, but through competition, they also increased quality. So public schools create a flow for quality of private education. If you want to increase education in Pakistan, increase uh, the quality of the worst performing schools, and that is uh, when actually increase pressure on all the schools. Uh, finally, uh, this is again a kind of a systems level approach, uh, which is, that in Pakistan, the number of girls who are passing now FAFSC and BA, the two-year BA, is increasing very dramatically. What this has done is now created uh, an opportunity for us. Uh, what in rural areas, one of the biggest constraints to expansion of education is that we don't have enough female teachers. But now the pool of educated women, modesty education out there, uh, is increasing very dramatically. And I think what we are going to see is we are at a cusp where we can actually, the resource constraint, that human resource constraint in provision of education will actually be alleviated and where we are seeing the results. So I think that Pakistan is at a situation where we are seeing more and more people being educated. Uh, the quality is low, but we know many ways in which to improve it. And I think with our young women, uh, the current core, which I would call the current baby boomer, which is the current adolescents who are entering adulthood, I think the real challenge is how to really get them into 
uh, labor market, particularly for women, labor force participation, and then with how to natural and family formation, marriage and having kids. These are all the papers that we have written to uh, uh, to the Leaps project. There are over 30 papers published all over the world in top high impact journals, and I think it's still continuing. Thank you very much. And I want to turn it over to Maria Ami. I, I hope you are still on Zoom and you can still hear me. I'll try and see if you can project it. Hey, you can, uh, yeah, okay, I'm right here. That's fantastic. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So, I think you have to know that you have to know primary education may have to be universal uh, education for all kids in Pakistan. This is what interested in. I have to say that the private school is the low cost private school. The reach is much more than Pakistan. In fact, the new public school is much more than that. And the share that I have mentioned here is about 25% of the share that the new school is the new school. तो आप में से अगर कोई सवाल पूछना चाहे ताहिर के लिए वरना मैं सवाल पूछना चाहता हूँ। वाइस के बेस्टिंग फॉर पीपल टू फॉर्मलेट दे थॉट्स ये बताइए ताहिर मेरा सवाल ये है कि अगर आप जो इस तरीके से फ्रैगमेंट कर देते हैं एजुकेशन को कि कुछ पब्लिक में है कुछ प्राइवेट में है कुछ मदरसे में है और कुछ काफी you know, Western liberal type education में है। तो इसका nation building के ऊपर और एक modern society के ऊपर कोई असर पड़ेगा और क्या वो matter करता है या नहीं ताहिर? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very often asked question. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. So speak up a little bit or low little up volume as well here. On the volume, I'll speak up. Hey, listen, that's a very big question. That's a very important question that's raised in Pakistan a lot. But uh, as for the sake of uh, being forceful, uh, I would say that's a misguided question. Okay? Uh, what you have to understand is Pakistan is a very large country. It's a very heterogeneous country. Uh, we are working in KP, uh, where uh, these new textbooks, international curriculum, has been imposed uh, in all the schools in Pakistan. And 85% of the people have a hard time reading those books because most of them are Pashto speaking and their parents are illiterate and uh, the books are really hard. So if you put a simple system on it, you've got to understand where Pakistan is. Pakistan, I just showed you the learning levels. The learning levels of our children are really low. You need to focus on that. That has to be the focus of the education system. Nation building will come later. I mean, I don't want to create a, the best way to build a nation is to stop creating a nation of illiterates. Paki hai to hai, hai Pakistani ideology, ke people should believe the same. Listen, we need to get the bottom of the, the pyramid, which is the largest number of kids in Pakistan. The largest number of kids in Pakistan barely know how to read and write. And my job is to really get that level up. Now, that is the biggest thing that you can do for nation building. I think that the English medium schools, the upper end schools, the high end schools are very small. We have something like 30 million kids in school. And what you are talking about, the fragmentation is a very small part of it, the top elite. I don't want our thinking about the elite to drive the education policy towards the poor. The poor are in really dire straits. We need to get them so that they can function in life. The best way to help the nation is to get people to function in life. So that they are independent learners. They can read, they can write, they can express themselves. I think that's where we are. I mean, we are not at a stage where you can start doing social engineering with these kids and with these people. That's a recipe for disaster. And it is a disaster. You try to impose something from the top, which is a, a centralized uh, situation on kids that are living in such different environments. In fact, this is a big battle in Pakistan. Should we go even more fragmented? I tell you that. Because that is much better. Because every I have data on 25,000 villages in Punjab. We are testing now 250,000 kids in Bishawar and Pradhan. Look at their conditions. Just go down. I have been to more schools than anybody you'll ever know in your life. 
And I think what we need to do is to keep the child front and center, not have these adults, babas, and other people who are thinking about nation building. We have seen the nation building project and where it is going. Okay. So let's not get back into education. That's I'm pretty serious, Mark. Obviously, I, I don't want Mark. You have, I'm uh, thinking because we're a friendly audience, so I do need a lecture on this because we're very influential people. Hmm. But my sense, the nation building part will come and I can talk more about it. We have taken, listen, the best, we have, we have done civics questions for kids. You know, whether they are good citizens. And I tell you, the best way to make good citizens is to make better students. That's, That's what I want to Obviously, you have uh, very clear views on this. Uh, and they are. Uh, no, but, but views are more by data, they're not my views. Let's get absolutely. Very clear. I'm not clear. That's, that's, that's even this more important. It's hugely important uh, that we are, uh, you know, we have stereotyped and pigeonholed uh, people and communities and nations into categories and uh, into ideologies and I think it's very refreshing to hear from you Tahir that we can, it doesn't matter, we should empower the people and educate them in the first instance. So that's really good to hear. Let me give you one clear example. In the one one year we are talking about, uh, we are giving uh, tests to third fifth graders in Pijama and Bajam. In mathematics there is something called a world problem. Do you remember this? Ahmad has five mangoes, his friend takes, gives him three more, how many mangoes does Ahmad have? No, that's a math world problem. Hmm. We get five word problems of this sort in our text. The median boy in KP cannot solve a single one of them. Single one of them. That's frightening. Have you done? Have you done? Right. So I think we'll be, move on to the next presenter, Joke Malia Amir, who is joining us from Georgia. Uh, one, one point for me. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Farooq Kumar in the audience. Uh, he has a question or comment. Farooq, go ahead. Uh, I, sorry, I late, joined late, but the last discussion, I disagree with, completely disagree. One thing the learned presenter said that Pakistani children are uh, at some low level to learn. I, no, I don't believe in it. The second thing about literacy, you know how the China get literated. There is one way of giving literacy at a lower level to educate in their native language. If you will impose English to first to class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in their KP or any area, the same the situation will be this. So we should try to teach them the early education in their native language, then we will not say they are unable to write or read. Yeah, okay. Do you want to uh, uh, comment quickly, Tahir, and then we'll move on to Malia? Listen, look, look, the language of instruction, uh, if you read the 1884 Commission of Punjab, they talked about language of instruction. Uh, every single uh, policy that has been enacted in Punjab National Education Policy talks about language of instruction. Uh, we have never solved uh, I think that what you are saying makes eminent sense, but apart from SIN, uh, where uh, Sindhi has been taught, uh, first off, uh, it's not the medium of instruction in KP, first off, it's not taught as a language. Punjabi is not a medium of instruction in Punjab, it's not taught as a language, neither it is in Rochistan, the people's languages. Uh, I agree, I would love to do an experiment on this in Pakistan and actually uh, try to do that. Uh, listen, I have I have taped 4,000 hours of classrooms in Pakistan. And you look at the actual language of instruction that is used. Chaya Mezi medium or Jobi ho, aapki baat bhoat sahi hai, yeh is, is a khasa hua khas hai. Or is masle ko humne hal karna hai, agar hum karna chahte hai. Lekin Pakistan mein joh humara joh national project hai, of national integration, woh kaitha ki eki jubaan honi chahi. Humara baas Urdu honi chahi hai, or Mezi honi chahi hai, or humara mawaab joh hai, woh dono nahi bhoat. Uh, so, I'm not going to say that, and I could agree with you. The other thing will move on to Malia, who is joining us in Georgetown. Malia, you can listen to us. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Malia. So, uh, we have a recorded version of your presentation, of uh, education for a disadvantaged thing. So, Malia is a graduate of LUMS, and she's uh, doing her uh, grad studies in Georgetown, Georgetown University in Washington. So we'll now listen to your recordings and we'll come back to you. So both for both yourself and Tahir uh, and people here in the audience, uh, 
uh, Ty talked about the ecosystem and the facilities in the government schools and in primary schools. So we have uh, another presenter, uh, Dr. Saeed from North America, who will join us later, and he will take you to a school, a primary school uh, in uh, Faisalabad, a village kind of semi-urban, semi-village school, and he will show you the walls and the grounds and the missing roofs there. So if you're interested, you can stay on. So we'll go on to the review from Aliyah right now. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity and I wish I could be there in person. Today, I will be presenting a case study on the post-COVID targeted instruction in Pakistan program and study that we implemented across 1250 public primary schools in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan between 2022 and 2023. For ease of reference, throughout this presentation, I will refer to the targeted instruction in Pakistan program as TIP. And for the remainder of the presentation, with apologies, I will have my video off so that my slides are visible. So let's dive in. While low learning has been a persistent challenge in the Pakistan education landscape, the urgent need for TIP arose from COVID-19 disruptions that shook Pakistan education ecosystem between April 2020 and October 2021, Pakistan faced intermittent school closures. Out of 250 school days, according to a UNICEF report, students just went to school for 60 days. The remaining time schools were either partially closed or completely closed, as you can see from these red outline bars on this graph. During this time of closures, the government and primary schools were trying their best to prioritize learning from home, um, ensure that distance learning was happening. But evidence shows that students from low socioeconomic status backgrounds with low tech access and no learning support at home who were already behind were likely to have been at the risk of falling further behind. And this prediction came true when we went to the field after COVID and conducted a first round of student testing in early 2022 across 1250 public schools and KP. The red shaded parts of the bars show that majority of the students need remediation across all subjects and all grades. While we see students performing relatively better in Urdu, English was the weakest subject across all grades after math. We also observed that students at higher grade levels were the most behind, and there can possibly be two reasons for this. Number one, learning losses compounded as kids were promoted upwards during COVID disruption period. Second, kids generally carry learning deficiencies as they move up the grade levels. So to solve this problem of exacerbated learning crisis because of COVID, we work with both the federal government and the KP provincial government to co-design and take the TIP program and study to 1250 public schools in KP. What is TIP? TIP is a foundational learning remedial program that builds basic skills of all primary students from classes one through five. The subject focus of this program is math, English, and Urdu because once kids have mastered these subjects, they can also understand other subjects and it also helps them in understanding advanced concepts at higher grade levels. While targeted instruction methodology is, has been tried and tested across the world, our program is unique in that it minimizes 
cost of administration in two ways. Number one, we use existing teachers, and number two, we provide these teachers with a low-cost technology to help them implement the program easily. I'll talk about both of these points later in the presentation. We also learned from global evidence that there's a high potential of targeted instruction interventions in improving student learning, and that too at the lowest cost possible. Drawing from the same evidence base, we also learned that structured lesson plans and technology can further boost student learning. But this global evidence on the effectiveness of targeted instruction and the local evidence that we had collected on students being behind were not sufficient to gain buy-in from stakeholders in the education ecosystem and to guarantee that there would be high take of tip in public schools. We had to be more rigorous, more hands-on on in embedding the program and integrating it into the provincial public um, education service delivery. The first thing we did was we used the systems level thinking approach that Fahir mentioned in his presentation to align the entire system around one shared purpose of addressing COVID learning losses and improving student learning through the implementation of TIP. And what we learned was that using COVID as a scapegoat helped mobilize support from all tiers of this education ecosystem. Our main counterpart was the KP Education Elementary and Secondary Education Department at the Secretariat level. But one tier below them, the subattached departments, um, we also worked closely with, with these units um, around curriculum recalibration, training design, implementation intervention model design, and with the monitoring department to ensure that well, the program was effectively and efficiently implemented in schools without any hindrances. The education management carter was very critical in ensuring that the implementation happens smoothly because they're the linchpin between the higher bureaucracy and the schools. Outside the education department, we interacted with the home department for necessary security clearances for program implementation and data collection. This proactive and continuous policy engagement, which was characterized by top-down, bottom-up, every which way strategies ensured that key stakeholders were number one, informed about it, and number two, that relevant policy changes were implemented in due time to allow and enable schools and teachers to implement it. The second part of our policy engagement focused specifically on teachers who are key actors and deliverers of the TIP program. We conducted baseline surveys with teachers to understand their mindsets, their beliefs, their constraints. Luckily, we found that 85% of the teachers agreed that students had fallen behind after COVID and there was a need for some sort of an intervention to help students catch up. They believe that the standard curriculum is over ambitious um, and super advanced for the students' learning levels. 94% of the teachers were also very keen on trying out new pedagogical approaches and tools to teach students at different learning levels and to address their learning needs. So through this process of engagement with teachers, we learned that as much as they agreed with TIP as, a, um, as an intervention, they did require additional support and assistance to implement this program in schools. Drawing from both global evidence and also from our extensive engagement with teachers, we conceived a 40-day TIP cycle, which begins with teachers testing students to identify learning gaps in 
the three core subjects, math, English, and Urdu, using standardized, standardized tests that we provided. Based on this initial diagnosis of learning gaps, teachers then sort students into learning levels or learning groups. Um, these are not based on the grade levels of students or the age levels of students, but really depending on how far behind students are, they are placed into groups accordingly. So for example, the highest learning group could have students from classes three, four, and five. The lowest learning group could have students from any of the five grades, one, two, three, four, or five. Um, and these groups vary for different subjects. Once students were sorted into groups, teachers then <coughs> used uh, lesson plans, uh, scripted lesson plans to tailor instruction to student needs for 40 consecutive days. And throughout this time, they also used low-stakes assessments that we have provided to them to repeatedly gauge students' understanding of the concepts that had been taught and to give one-on-one -on -one support to any student that was still lagging behind. To address the constraint that was posed by teachers about the need for additional support and assistance to implement the program, we specially designed a low-cost technology software which automated the four steps of KIPP um, that I described earlier. This tool could be, can be used on any personal device, whether it's a smartphone, it's a tablet, it's a, tablet, it's a laptop or computer. Um, but what we did was we made a mobile application of it because we found that about 70% of the teachers in our sample were smartphone users. Another thing we did was we made sure that the software's interface resembled that of the WhatsApp UI UX because about 72% of teachers showed confidence in using WhatsApp irrespective of age and gender. The randomized controlled trial used the entire program sample. There were two questions we were trying to answer through this impact evaluation. First, does the program improve student learning across grades and across the three subjects? Number two, do teachers take up this technology tool to implement the program? And if they do so, how does that impact student learning? So what did we do? And we randomized the, the 1250 schools into these five groups. The first group did not have access to the technology tool, but they had to implement the program for 40 days. The second group were required to use the technology tool to implement the program for 40 days. The third group had the option of using or not using the technology to implement the program for the 40 days. The fourth group had to use the technology for the first two weeks of the program, and after that, they had the option of opting in or opting out. The fifth group was a pure control group that neither received the program nor did they have access to the technology tool. The purpose of this group was to compare it to the rest of the groups um, and see whether the program had any impact on student learning. So what did we find? Broadly, we found that the program was successful in improving student learning that student learning gains were achieved across all subjects and grades. In math in particular, class four experienced the largest learning gains, such that the percentage of students who were at grade level at the baseline doubled, tripled at the end of the 40 days. And we saw similarly encouraging learning gains at the grade three level. In Urdu, we saw students substantially improve in learning across all grades. Although English was the weakest subject at the baseline, we still saw the number of students at class four level doubling at the end of the 40-day cycle. 
Another interesting result is that the schools that were required to use technology, they had lower learning gains compared to schools which either had the option to use technology or which only received the paper version of the program. And this goes on to show that innovation may impose additional burdens on teachers that may have negative impact on teacher performance and thus may not give high student learning gains. We also observed gender variation in student learning gains. In English and Urdu, we saw students having performed better than girls having performed better than boys. In math, we saw really interesting results. So students, so girls to us started behind boys, but they caught up to the learning levels of boys across different treatment groups. This shows that better performance in languages likely helped boost girls' performance in the math test, especially in questions related to word problems. So what are the policy implications from the program and study? We find that just 40 days of the program showed large gains in student learning. This shows a high potential to scale tip across Pakistan, but it must be executed in the most cost-effective manner and with minimal support. Secondly, a one-size-fits-all approach may not be, and is certainly not the solution to the learning crisis. We must iterate and adapt for contextual requirements. And we see large and massive evidence of that in the mandate of technology treatment group, where when teachers were forced to use a technology tool, the learning gains were not as high as the learning gains we saw in groups where teachers either had the flexibility to use um, technology or not use it, or in groups where teachers were only supposed to use the paper version. One of the major challenges in the implementation of this program and study was the repeated transfers of teachers within and outside sample schools. While the downside of such a churn is attrition, which may impact results ultimately, there is a high value in leveraging teacher transfers as a vehicle for the sustainable diffusion and persistence of reforms like TIP in Pakistan's education fancy. With this, my presentation is over. Thank you so much for your time and we look forward to your questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Melina. Uh, so you are there, so I can see you. Uh, Order to school so I'll have a presentation keep it just so you can see how teachers process can sign nay technology widely or actually cheaply available as well as the market uh novel techniques, new methods to deal with the educational crisis which has been exacerbated by COVID and how to actually capitalize on what we've got. Uh so I'll present that there. Quick, quick, uh, quick question. Yeah. So you can just shout. Okay, okay. okay. My question is that uh, the study was post-COVID with the uh, traditional teaching was hampered. Have you uh, compared it this improvement in learning? by use of technology, the smartphone, the software, with when uh, that was the traditional, or after COVID, when the traditional came back. And compared the two? So I think you're asking is... Uh, I'm asking is that that was due to the COVID, you used the technology for helping, uh, to help the learning. 
but then there is a traditional way of learning in the, those areas of Pakistan. Can you compare this with the traditional improvement working technology ki wajah se ki ya us waqt humne ke kyunki problem tha usse improve kiya hai matlab aise do pehlu hai par usa tarashi pe ke wo ye hai ki covid ke darmiyan zara ke learning se pehle bhi hui aur naye tarike bhi nikal aaye lekin usse pehle ki jo teaching thi uske jo covid ke baad ki teaching thi maliya usme koi farak tha ya nahi aur jo covid ke darmiyan technologies introduce ki gayi टीचिंग teaching on alternate days etc so is tarah ki cheeze introduce in covid mein they would have returned back to the normal routine after covid so therefore uh, have we gained something from covid times as well in terms of uh, new ways of teaching and thinking so the first thing is that as i mentioned in my presentation we had a control group and the control group was not doing the tip program the control group was not using the technology so that was the traditional pedagogy that they were doing and they were doing business as usual teaching and learning without any technology to humne apne jo treatment groups hain humne humne unhe compare kiya apne control group ke sath and the results that i showed we do see that you know there's a um, the treatment groups are doing better the ones that receive the program the ones that receive the technology they're doing better they have gained learning The second thing is in terms of your question about ki unhone jo pedagogy ya tarike apnaye the during covid closures ya agar koi technology solutions use kiye the did that have a spillover effect we didn't systematically study that but we did observe that the public school teachers jab humne unse focus group discussions kiye um they were not really involved in student learning during closures private schools mein zyada tha jahan pe wo bachcho ko cheeze send kar rahe the in public schools in certain areas for example in islamabad jo ki hamara study sample nahi tha wahan pe they have certainly you know used whatsapp a lot um to send materials to to students and all but um kb ke sample mein jahan pe humne ye study ki thi wahan pe as such during covid closures uh teachers aur bachcho ka as such itna koi interaction nahi raha tha lekin whatsapp ka jo istemal hai that certainly something which we are seeing that because teachers are comfortable with it uh, even before covid they were using the uh, whatsapp for you know just regular communication within the school uh, with the um, communication with education managers um us uske saath jo unki familiarity hai aur confidence hai we did see that being useful in the use of the technology that we have offered in the program Thank you. That's fantastic. I think we must move on. We have a change of flavor right now. Uh, I have my friend, uh, Dr. Zaid, Dr. Zaid Tashir, who is here. He is here. He is a professor of our college, a medical college as a principal. And so he will actually talk about uh, non-medical education for medical students and doctors, uh, which is a concept maybe a little bit uh, foreign in Pakistan, but very widely accepted. in uh, most of the countries including britain where i work so dai bashir will uh, uh, call me now um, after dai talk uh, we will come back to another talk from north america by said um, and maybe then we can have a uh, uh, quick discussion uh, about the general primary education I'll be talking about a little experiment that we've done at uh, Shalamar Medical and Dental College, uh, and this is introducing humanities and social sciences in uh, the medical education curriculum. So, <clears throat> what made us think about these things? These are the university regulations, and I think they would be the same here. Uh, let's say. Uh, 
principal must certify that the candidates concerned have actually attended 75% of the lectures delivered and practical clinical sessions conducted during the academic year in each of the subject of examination. So why 75%? I came from a university where you could not miss a single clinical session. Why 75%? You're all in medical education. You're all part of the faculty. Why have we fixed 75% of the lectures and clinical sessions? But this makes you eligible. That's the message that we're telling our students. Would we like a doctor who had missed one fourth of the practical clinical sessions? It's somebody who has missed the entire cardiology rotation or the entire ER rotation. Is that something that we want? This is the minimum I agree, but this is where you allow and legally cannot stop somebody who has met this criteria. Then it says, during the academic year in each of the subject of examination. What happens in final year? <clears throat> the subjects of examination are medicine, surgery, gynae and pediatrics. What does this 75 percent mean there? Is it that year of examination? Is it just final year, medicine, surgery, pediatrics and uh, or is it all three years or in some cases from year one to year five? Because now you start early clinical exposure. Anybody? <clears throat> what is the opinion of the house? Does this mean only final year? Or does this mean year one to five? Year one to five. Uh, <clears throat> All right, but a lot of people interpreted this as because you're sending up students in the final year. They said during the academic year, so the academic year for them was final. And we looked at this and we found out that about 55% of the teaching of clinical subjects that <laughs> students are supposed to appear in final year takes place during year three and four. And it's only 45% that takes place during year five. So if somebody interprets this as 75% of the 45%, this would really mean 30% of the entire academic program. So these are things that we <coughs> made us think. 75% in each subject. So what happens if somebody has an 80% dependence in three subjects and has a 74% dependence in the fourth subject? Should he or she be allowed to appear? Should he or she be allowed to appear in all subjects? Or should he or she not be allowed to appear in any subject? <coughs> if she's allowed to appear in all subjects, the minimum criteria is not met. If you allow that person to appear in three out of four subjects, there comes the dilemma of an attempt. So he appears in three subjects out of four, he will have a second attempt, and that attempt certificate is something that we carry for the rest of our lives. Everywhere you go, whether it's a public service commission, whether it's your house job, whether you're preparing for postgraduate training, this attempt certificate will keep you below that. Uh, then, the assessments. So, what we say is that some regulations say that you should have passed the, the sent up examination. So is that the only requirement there should be? Somebody who is studying in medicine from year one to five, does he or she be allowed to just pass the center or should there be 
formative and summative assessment and should that formative assessment have any weightage. The regulations unfortunately say very little about this. I know that most schools, uh, medical schools in Pakistan, you have to clear the rotation examinations, clinical examinations. But going by the book, this is something that you cannot do. Then we looked at the university results uh, year on year and we found that there was a great variation year on year. So you'd have, you would have a result of 60% in one year and 90% in the other year. So with a cohort of 8-10,000 students, is that the student's fault or is that the examination fault? Examination fault. <laughs> the back bank it's the examination fault. I'm sure people sitting on the front would say it's the student's fault. And then the other thing is that you have four subjects being examined, they have 90% results in three, the fourth is 30%. Again, who is at fault? Is it the student or is it the examination? So with this, these things that uh, made us start thinking, we looked at the competencies of medical graduates and these are the usual seven star doctors that we talk about. So skills, knowledge, attitude, professionalism is something common. They say researcher, and scholar, communicator, community health provider, management, leadership, advocacy, community leader, critical thinking. I'm sure we all address knowledge and skills. For professionalism, we think that uh, they would learn it because they're role models, they have role models, and because they're in the medical profession, so they would probably be professionals in any way. Do we deal with management or leadership? Do we deal with critical thinking? Do we deal with advocacy? Do we deal with community health promoter? Anybody in the house? Do we do that in our curriculum? <laughs> we thought very little. So what we did was that we thought that these are things that should be addressed and we were one of the first institutions that developed a curriculum and a department of bioethics and a department of communication skills, not headed by doctors, headed by people who have uh, doctorates in linguistics and language. For management and uh, things like critical thinking, we thought we had to go outside the institution because we did not have expertise and we could not afford to develop the entire infrastructure. So we went to a university by the name of Lahore University of Management Sciences, which is in Lahore, and we discussed that these are things that we want to impart in our graduates. And we picked up about 60 courses And we saw that uh, the faculty and 
especially senior faculty who were more uh, geared towards courses that were related to biology and genetics and molecular biology. The younger faculty would go into courses like uh, computing, artificial intelligence, uh, nanotechnology. <coughs> and I wonder if you can see this. Uh, so we had courses uh, like uh, computational problem solving, experimental chemistry, writing and communication, genetics, molecular biology, fundamentals of organic chemistry, neuroscience, immunology. <coughs> and then we had courses which were introduction to programming, functional materials, modern devices, drug discovery and development. to programming, artificial intelligence, software engineering, computing, uh, digital image processing, electronics, laser engineering, electromagnetic fields, spectroscopy, laser engineering. And uh, out of these, we picked up about four, four courses and the rest were optional. First part. So these were the courses that we picked up based on the feedback from the faculty. And uh, these are core courses that everybody has to go through. Logic, critical thinking, biochemistry, biology, molecular biology, genetics. And these are courses that they have, they have an option to take. So these are elective courses, uh, which is computers and problem solving, management sciences, information systems management, microeconomics, personal effectiveness, entrepreneurship, uh, law, constitutional law, uh, and scientific imagination. <coughs> so we uh, went to the medical dental council and the university that we are affiliated with and we said that this is something that we want to launch. And they said, uh, on a thing going, uh, how can you create this elitist culture? You have another extra year. We said we're not after money. All this entire one year course would be funded by the institution, so the students will have to pay zero amount for the entire year, which is about 1.3 million per student. We funded, we were ready to fund for the students, but we didn't get any permission from the uh, either the university or the commission. They would keep sending us from one to the other. The, the medical council would say it's not our uh, domain. You go to the university, and the university would say. We go to the BMDC. Ultimately, this, this is something that we started in 2014. And for nine years, we kept on going from one organization to the other. Ultimately, we said, all right, enough is enough. We're going to go ahead, whatever it takes. So last year, we announced this, and we had about 200 applicants for this course. Uh, only eight out of them were on our merit. And out of those eight, the lungs had an interview and they selected four people. So we could accommodate 20, but this is the cohort of only four people who have gone into this program. Uh, and we sent them in year one so that there is no break in their academic program because again, that is something that would create a problem. So they spent one year there and then they come back into the medical school and spent five years in, in the medical program. Uh, the students have been very excited and uh, they especially are interested in research and they're interested in critical thinking and logic and reasoning and, and things like artificial intelligence, nanotechnology. So if we look at the feedback from the students, they are more interested in things of the future. Which unfortunately, if we talk with the faculty, they are more conservative, they're more conventional and they want to restrict things like biology and genetics and molecular biology. But giving them an option of elective courses, uh, I think we've given them an opportunity to learn beyond the boundaries of the uh, pure medical curriculum. 
One other thing that we felt was that uh, a large number of graduates go into private practice. They set up their own clinics, the hospitals, the labs. And during the curriculum, we've not trained them how to manage an independent organization or how to be uh, skillful in that, how to deal with finances, human resource, with procurement. So these are things that we think should be introduced. And even at the faculty level, we think that uh, most of our faculty is not trained in these things. Whereas the civil services, the military bureaucracy, most of them go through training courses at the DIPA or the Pakistan Energy Staff College and they learn how to manage things. Uh, the medical profession unfortunately does not cater to that and when somebody lands up in an administrative position, which is either the head of the department or the head of an institution, we feel that they are not uh, appropriately trained. So when you become a head of department, somebody will just say that, all right, we have a new 600 bed uh, surgical tower that is coming up and you the project director. How many of us are really trained for that? The answer is none of us. That's what I feel. Maybe some of you are more trained. So, uh, we started this uh, in 2023. We had the first batch this year. We have the second batch, but again, uh, because now the admissions are going to be centralized, so we will have a cohort of a very small number of students which we will offer. In addition to this, we've offered uh, summer courses to our students. So if somebody is not interested in spending the entire year, they can take one course uh, every summer. So they can take five out of these courses. And uh, I think uh, we were excited about it, Lance was excited, the students were excited. Uh, one problem that we felt was that it was mostly the A-level students who were more interested and more willing to go into this program. Because of course it is an extra year of your life, even if it is funded. So that's something that we're trying to struggle with, that how do we bring everybody on the same page and uh, get excited. So thank you very much. I'm open to questions. We'll have uh, room for one or two questions. I have to say uh, a more uh, very quick question and a very short answer, please. Assalamualaikum. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you very much for that talk. It was very, very fascinating. Um, I think there's a huge room, especially uh, for having a year out in medical training. Uh, to do subject-specific things in different areas just have been set up here. And this is actually a very common practice in the United Kingdom. We have a year out just so you do your integrated BSc. You can do it in um, non-medical subjects. You can do it in management, history of medicine, philosophy. And I think these are hugely very, very important skills going forward, like you said, when you come into positions of administration as well. My question would be is, Marshall, this is an excellent, I think this is an excellent incentive. You've got 20 people uh, right now that you're funding. How, how can you make this something that can be self-sustainable, something that perhaps we'd be able to offer all medical students? And, and honestly, looking down something we can perhaps have to the greater um, medical, school, medical schools within Pakistan as well. Well, I think, uh, as long as, as far as the sustainability uh, thing is concerned, I think ultimately this is something that we have to be funded by the students themselves. Because uh, we fund, we're funding it because we wanted to create that excitement and we wanted to create that interest because uh, we thought that uh, asking students to spend an extra year and spend an extra amount and this is private education. Uh, Shalamar is a private institution, Lam is a private institution. So we thought we could share some of the burden and once this gets into flow and we have more and more people exposed to it and they come back, they will be our ambassadors. And they will create that excitement that this is something that's important, this is something that uh, they've, they've added value to their life. Uh, as far as uh, making it sustainable for everybody, I think ultimately if we can develop these departments within our own institutions, uh, and initially maybe we may collaborate so you can have one department management sciences that deals with multiple institutions 
so that's uh, how I think we can sustain it. Once, uh, of course, it's an economy of scales. So if you have uh, 8,000 students going into this program, we can definitely have faculty uh, who can train. He's not like you, sir. Uh, I'm so sorry we have to go on uh, because uh, when those two have America may go Mahabir Midnight on your birthday or anything. That's what I'm like. See, very quick question. Very quick question. Very quick question. Very quick question. You told that these students are interested in critical and logical learning and you are training the faculty and you, you thought and you, this is your uh, research, the faculty training is a little bit deficient. Isn't it? <laughs> Who will should train the faculty for training the students? Uh, I think you have to have a very strong faculty development program because that's something that we usually do not have in institutions. We think that somebody who's uh, come into uh, a medical school as a faculty is good enough for the rest of the 30 or 40 years. So it's a continuous process. So we at our institution have uh, introduced these subjects for the faculty. So anybody who goes from an assistant professor to an associate professor has to have mandatory courses on management, on human resource management, on procurement. Uh, my question, sorry, my question is, what is the ultimate source of training the faculty? You are training the faculty and you are being trained by, and who is trained by, what is the ultimate source from where the knowledge is coming? Uh, it's, uh, ultimate I'm also sorry to start the day. It's a philosophical uh, question. So, uh, uh, it is a question. Uh, I'm really sorry. So, uh, I have to move on to our next presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, the next presentation is by uh, Dr. Ronald C. Lasper, who is uh, a Cambodian class of 86, my class of law and science. Say, are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. So if you turn your video on, we should see you as well. Do you have any people here who want to see you? Yes. So, yeah, so uh, you have uh, you have silver hair, which is... Yes, uh, you look like a saint, all of it. And an aura, and uh, that makes you look like a saint. So that's really good. I, I think uh, Saint uh, is an oncologist, but he's done a lot of work in Fastenbach, promoting primary education. Uh, so if they have video saying that that's okay, that you have recorded and then come back to you for one or two questions. Is that alright? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. Excellent. So the um, 
आप आज मैं आपको डिस्क्राइब करूंगा जो मेरा जर्नी है एक स्कूल के साथ जिसमें मैंने सबसे ज्यादा काम किया है इस स्कूल का नाम है गवर्नमेंट एलिमेंट्री स्कूल गोखुआ जो मेरे घर से तकरीबन बीस पच्चीस मिनट के पास से पर है कार तो इस स्कूल के बहुत ही बुरे हालात थे और उसके हेड मास्टर साहब मेरे एक दोस्त को जानते थे और वो कह रहे थे कोई बंदा अगर हमारी हेल्प कर दे तो अदरवाइज हम सरवाइव नहीं कर सकेंगे तो फिर मैंने जाके मिला तो उन्होंने इनिशियली सोचा कि ये कोई बोक्स है कोई ऐसे लेकिन जब मिला फिर हमने उस स्कूल के बहुत ही बुरे हालात थे स्कूल में हर चीज की कमी थी स्कूल के बच्चे जमीन पर बैठे हुए थे ज्यादातर और स्कूल की छतें बिल्कुल टूट गई हुई थी और एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट ने स्कूल को स्कूल के कमरों को बंद कर दिया होता बच्चों की सेफ्टी के लिए क्योंकि जो उसकी छते वो सेफ थी तो जब हम पहली दफा गए तो सोचा कि क्या किया जाए तो रिक्वायरमेंट्स काफी यूज थी तो उसमें एक तो छतों का उन्होंने तो, तो काम बड़ा है गवर्नमेंट को करना चाहिए डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एजुकेशन जिन्होंने इस बिल्डिंग को अनहेबिटेबल करा दिया है उसको भी काम करना चाहिए तो मैंने कहा ये तो वैल्यू करूँगा इसको कर आप गवर्नमेंट से कोशिश करें कि वो करें तो गवर्नमेंट ने नेचुरली कुछ भी नहीं किया बच्चे बाहर बैठे हुए थे सारे बच्चे स्कूल के बाहर बैठे थे पहली इंट्रैक्शन में हमने सारे उनके डेस्क के मसले हल कर दिए तो सारे बच्चे जो है डेस्क में बैठने शुरू हो गए तो जब मैं छः महीने बाद वापस आया तो स्कूल के उतने बुरे हालात थे और उनकी जो छतें बिल्कुल मैं करता थी तो तो मैंने कहा अच्छा मैं एक अब जो ब्लॉक है ना तीन ब्लॉक में से उसकी छत डलवा देता हूँ बाकी आप गवर्नमेंट से कहें तो वो ये छतें डलवाए इसी तस्वीर में मेरे स्लाइड प्रेजेंटेशन में है तो लेकिन गवर्नमेंट में चेंज नहीं अगर वापस आया तो फिर उन्होंने भी ये काम किया होता तो फिर मैंने ही इन छतों को डरवाया और उसको सेव करके बच्चे अब क्लासेस में बैठना शुरू हो गए इससे काफ़ी बच्चों को फायदा हुआ कि वो वैदर से भी बचे और उसके बाद उनके पास टेस्ट भी आ गए थ्रू आउट दिस पीरियड इस सारे दौरानी में हमने टेस्ट के अलावा उनकी यूनिफॉर्म पर भी फोकस रखा होता है कि यूनिफॉर्म की जो हर दफ़ा नीड होती है और रिक्वेस्ट होती है उनकी सारे कमरों के शीशे टूटे हुए थे तो सर्दियों में ठंड आती थी तो सारे हमने शीशे भी लगवाए सारे कमरों के ये तकरीबन दस साल पहले की बात है उसके बाद फिर पानी का बड़ा मसला था तो हमने पानी का टैंक बनवाया जिसपे काफ़ी हमारी इन्वेस्टमेंट हुई लेकिन अब बच्चे अब उससे पानी पीते हैं उसके बाद फिर हमने सोचा कि आप लाइब्रेरी भी बनाई जाए तो फिर हमने एक लाइब्रेरी कमरा जो ऑलरेडी था उसको पेंट करवा के उसमें नई किताबें भी लगवाई अलमारियाँ भी लगवाई और फर्नीचर सारा दिया टेबल और उसके साथ कुर्सियाँ भी दी तो आप बच्चे इधर किताबें ले के पढ़ सकते हैं और हर दफ़ा मैं ज़्यादा उनको पूछे कि कितनी कितनी किताबें पढ़ी हैं ताकि उनका नज हो कोर्स के अलावा किताबें पढ़ने का उनको आइडिया उसके बाद ये उनकी कंप्यूटर का काफ़ी मसला था हर दफ़ा एक मसला होता था तो हमने बनाना शुरू किया कंप्यूटर रूम जो हमने बिल्कुल नया कमरा बना के शुरू किया उसमें फिर हमने कंप्यूटर डलवाए उसको क्लासरूम में भी बदल दिया और उसमें कई कंप्यूटर कंप्यूटर है और उसमें जो कुछ कंप्यूटर मैं अमेरिका से लेके आया हूँ जो मैंने उधर रखवाए हैं उन्होंने ये वर्किंग कंप्यूटर लगाया है उसके अंदर प्रिंटर भी है और बच्चे कंप्यूटर सीखते हैं 
तो ये काफी सक्सेसफुल प्रोजेक्ट था उसके अलावा फिर हमने हर चीज जो स्कूल में तकरीबन टच की है स्कूल के पास बहुत ही अच्छी ग्राउंड थी बहुत ही बड़ी तरीके उससे मिट्टी घटा था ना कोई घास थी तो हमने उसको प्रोजेक्ट बनाया कि उसको ना फुटबॉल यानी सॉकर की ग्राउंड में मदद दी है तो उसके लिए काफी एफर्ट लगी उसमें हमने फिर घास खरीदी मैं मास्टर पार्ल में गया हमने घास खरीदी फिर मजदूर लगवाए वो उधर ना बीज दी ग्राउंड के अंदर फिर पंप लगवाया समर्सिबल पंप लगवाया ताकि पानी को फिर घास काटने की भी मशीन लगवाई और लेके दी स्कूल को तो अब जो ग्राउंड है ना वर्किंग ग्राउंड है सॉकर की उसमें बच्चे खेलते हैं फिर मान्य के बच्चे भी खेलते हैं और उसमें आप सॉकर के मैच भी होते हैं अब एक स्लाइड आप देख सकते हैं इसमें मैच भी टीमें के इसमें यूज़ करती हैं उसके बाद फिर हमने और जो किया है स्कूल में वो यूनिफॉर्मों का काफी मसला है और हर दफा मैं जब चीज़ लेने जाता हूँ तो उनको यूनिफॉर्म लेके लेता हूँ उसके बाद जूता शूज का भी काफी मसला था तो ये भी फिर उनको जितने भी बच्चों को शूज अब हमने दो दो दफा शूज भी लेके लिए ये इसके अलावा अब जो नाम अच्छा मैं गया हूँ तो फिर वो शीशे पे टूट गए हुए थे ये कुछ पिछले महीने की बात है ना नवंबर की तो सारे तभी ना सारे जो जो किटी हैं उनके शीशे ने लगवाए हैं तो वो बच्चों की नींद की के ठंड आती है यह सब भी तो which makes sense तो तो सारे ने ये लगवा के लिए यूनिवर्स भी लेके दिए हैं उनको स्पोर्ट्स का इक्विपमेंट भी लेके दिया है और एक लेडी जो टीचर हैं उनका ऑफिस उनका उनके पास तो एक कमरे को हमने उनके ऑफिस में बदल दिया है उसमें टाइलें लगवा के उसको नाइस करके अब इस पर बात मैंने उसमें सफेदी और पेंट करवा के और अलमारी भी लेके दी है उनको ताकि वो लेडीज अपनी चीजें रख सके उसके अंदर और जो भी उनकी नींद थी तो एक बिहार अभिनव ब्यूटीफुल अच्छा कमरा बन गया है थे और जो मर्दों का कमरा उनके बहुत फर्नीचर नहीं था तो उसमें भी हमने कुर्सियां और बीज लेके रखे जो मेल टीचर है वो भी आराम से बैठ सके आपने जब उसे ट्राई पारे किया स्कूल के अंदर तो ये मसले जो ये स्कूल में हमारी काफी इन्वेस्टमेंट हुई है लेकिन स्कूल की हालत भी बदल गई है मतलब हम उसको जहाँ पर स्कूल से जमाने में बिल्कुल क्लोजिंग पे था लेकिन आप हमने उसको सस्टेन कर दिया और उसको बड़ी हाई लेवल कर दिया अब मैं जब क्या हूँ मैंने स्कूल के बाहर पेंट भी करवा रहा है गेट पे आप देख सकते हैं फिर जो तस्वीर है उसकी तो स्कूल की हालत ही बदल गई है ये जो मसले हैं स्कूलों के ये जनरली एलिमेंट्री स्कूल और प्राइमरी स्कूल में है जब भी मैं हाई स्कूल में जाता हूँ तो हालात इतने बुरे नहीं हैं हाई स्कूल की डिफरेंट फंडिंग होती है जो फंडिंग है मिडिल स्कूल और प्राइमरी स्कूल की वो उनके बिजली के बिल में चली जाती है जो फंडिंग होती है उनको बेसिकली दे काफ़ी स्ट्रगल होते हैं और उनको गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से कोई पैसे नहीं आते एक समान में तो अगर आई मैं इसमें मॉल ना होता तो वो बच्चे अभी भी बाहर बैठे होते तो ये एक स्टोरी है एक स्कूल की लेकिन है कि मैं तकरीबन तीस दर्जन स्कूलों में काम चल कर चुका हूँ तकरीबन दस मतलब पिछले दस साल के दौरान और कुछ हर स्कूल की कुछ अपनी अलग मसले भी होते हैं लेकिन ज़्यादातर मसले वही कॉमन है यानी उनकी फंडिंग नहीं है उनके डेस्क नहीं है उनके यूनिफॉर्म का मसला है वाइट वाइट बोर्ड्स का मसला है देखिए बेसिकली लैक ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट जो पॉलिसी हम फॉलो करते हैं फाउंडेशन से हम उनको चीज़ें खरीद के देते हैं और मेक श्योर के जो वो प्रॉपरली यूज़ करते हैं यूज़ करें और ऑनेस्ट हों ये बाई पी पिटिशन तो जो चीज़ें हम यूजली उसको पैसे नहीं देते अल्लाह से जो नॉर्मल प्रोजेक्ट 
ہم صرف چیزیں لے کے دے دیتے ہیں اور وہ اگلی دفعہ جب میں جاتا ہوں تو میں چیک کرتا ہوں کہ چیزیں پراپرلی مینٹین ہیں اور پرزنٹ ہیں سو یہ جو مسئلے میں پوائنٹ آؤٹ کر رہا ہوں وہ بہت جنیرک ہیں اور بہت ہی افیکٹ کر رہے ہیں یانگ بچوں کو اس لیے اگر آپ نے سے بھی کوئی یہ اقرام کرنا شروع کرے تو بچوں کو کافی فائدہ ہو سکتا ہے ان کے لئے اپنے جدر میں نہیں جا سکتا ہے میں نہیں کر سکتا ہے میں ایسا ٹھیک نہیں ہے میں کام کرتا ہوں کیونکہ میں ایسا سفر میں رہتا ہے تو میں اسی لئے میں کام کرتا ہوں سکولوں میں لیکن مجھے پکا ہے کہ میں کہ پاکستان ہے دوسرے ایئر میں بھی پرائیمی اور ایلیمنٹری سکولز جو آٹھ ہی دوبارہ تک ہیں ان میں یہ ہی حالات ہے اور یہ ہی مسئلہ ہے تو جی تینکیو بیر بیر سعید ہم نے آپ کی پریزنٹیشن سنی ماشاء اللہ بری کوئی کوئی تو اگر آپ کو میری آواز آ رہی ہے تو اپنے سارے لائے لاہور تو آپ میں سے کتنے لوگ ایسے ہیں جن کے لیے جو سیچویشن نے ڈسکرائب کی ہے سعید نے وہ فیملیر ہے آپ نے دیکھی ہے کہ ایسے سکول ہوں جن کی چھتے نہ ہوں دیوارے نہ ہوں بینچز نہ ہوں بچے باہر بیٹھ رہے ہیں لوگوں نے دیکھا ہے اور کوئی ایسا بھی ہے جس نے ایسے سکول میں پڑھا فارچنیٹلی نہ ہوں کہ اس ایلیز آگینس آئی گیس تو سعید سے آپ کی سوال پوچھتا ہے پرائیمیٹ ایکیشن کے بارے میں میں نے ایک سوال پوچھا جاتا ہوں سعید آپ نے یہ بتایا ہے یا بریف ایکیشن کیا کہ ایک تو آپ نے ابھی موڈل یا پروڈو ٹائپ کا پریزنٹ کیا ایک پرائیمی سکول کے بارے میں فیصل آپ کے کارکٹر میں تو یہ ورک ٹرم نمبر تھری ڈزن سچ سکولز اس نے پرائیم سعید تو آپ کے ساتھ میں یہ سب اگر گورنمنٹ کے سکول ہیں تو کیا بہت ہے کہ گورنمنٹ کے بارے اتنے پیسے نہیں ہیں کہ کوئی اتنی سیسٹ اور سیف سپیس پروائیڈ کر سکیں کہ ہاں پہ کہ وہ پڑھ سکیں بے دی فنڈ جو فنڈنگ آتی ہے وہ بہت ہی کام ہے اور جو مجھے بتایا جاتا ہے کہ ان کے بیجی کے پہلی اتنے ہوتے ہیں کہ وہ سوارا اسی کے پرچے میں چلا جاتا ہے تو جو امپروومنٹ کی فنڈنگ ہے وہ بیسکلی نیکس ٹو نتنگ سو تو یہ کیا بھی لی دے کن بے بھی سسٹین یو نو تاکس تیچر سیلوریز در پی اینڈ اینڈ ایس پڑی مانچ ہے اینڈ دے ہیو الیکٹرسٹی بہت ادھر دن دا دے اینڈ دے دے کن نوٹ ڈیویلپ اینیتنگ نیو دے کن نوٹ بائی اینیتنگ نیو دے کن نوٹ بیلڈ ایل لیب دے کن نوٹ بیلڈ ایل لائٹری فار ایسامپل فار دیٹ بھی دے سگنیفیکن فنڈنگ وچ دے ڈون ہے So I think it has to come from another source. Ideally, it should come from the government, but it isn't. So bottom line is that uh, I've seen many times the Department of Education, people check them out, and I've seen them enjoying a, a soccer match, um, watching a soccer match in the ground, soccer ground that was built, but they never really invested in it, you know. So. But they come and check the school. For, uh, I've seen them repeatedly in the school checking this and checking that. But uh, without funding, uh, it really has no relevance, to be honest. So, the staff is the staff, and the children are the staff, and the children are the staff? Yes, staff is the staff, and the children are the staff, and the children are the staff. They try their best. Some te teachers are read, some of the teachers are really very, very good. They're very devoted and they try to um, improve things, uh, getting funding from other sources, whatever they could. And um, so some of the teachers are really very, they try very hard to provide for these kids and provide them a decent uh, 
building and place and atmosphere to learn. Right. Is Mr. Tahir still on? Sorry, I'm saying that. I'm tired of two sides of. Sorry. Sorry, I'm one question. Uh, uh, what is the rate? Uh, you can't see the questioner. This is Ayyub Bashir, who is our classmate. Hi, Sir Tahir. Salam alaikum, Bhai. Salam alaikum, Sir. We were just. Uh, I think my own number is good in charge of the product. So what sort of funding does one school require? So after experience, how many amount do you need to become a school board to make it functional? Touch it. How many school board do you need to fund? How many total amount do you need to fund? If somebody wants to fund, let's say, one school, how many funding do you need to make it really functional? Touch it. How many school board do you need to fund? Let's say, one school, how many funding do you need to make it really functional? Average. Average it depends. In school पे हमारे तो खर्चा तकरीबन तीस चालीस लाख हो चुका है। तो ये एक डेस्क का आपको बताऊँ एक डेस्क जो आता है ना वो आज आजकल नौ हजार पांच सौ पैसे एक डेस्क का। हाँ नहीं आये वही नहीं नहीं गवर्नमेंट का डेवलपमेंट फंड के लिए तो जैसे भी एक स्कूल बन गया एंड उसके बाद उसकी जो ऑपरेशनल बजट होत वो यूजुअली इस समथिंग दैट दे डोंट रियली थिंक अबाउट या दस्तूर या सर ऑपरेशन ऑपरेशन बजट इज मिसिंग यस सही आई डिफरेंट स्कूल्स हैव डिफरेंट नीड्स नॉर्मली आई गो टू स्कूल्स एंड आई रियली पुट लॉट ऑफ एम्पसेस ऑन प्रोवाइडिंग डेस्क्स टू द स्कूल बिकॉज़ आई थिंक सिटिंग ऑन द फ्लोर एंड सिटिंग ऑन ए डेस्� so I go to schools and basically buy them desks. So like in November I went to a girls' school. Uh, um, yeah, it has 1,700 students and very nice headmistress. So she signed her dress and uh, there were like out of 120 girls were sitting on the floor. So we just uh, completed their seating arrangement, uh, and that alone cost us. Uh, so this is just one school and one visit and I don't plan to go back because that school was good otherwise just uh, they didn't have uh, seating uh, they seem to have everything else uh, but uh, different schools are different needs are different and uh, uh, you know in, uh, uh, I don't know I've done most of the uh, work in this particular school but I've done I do almost pick two or three other schools Every time we go to pick and we work on that as well. Uh, so that is fantastic. Uh, we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, actually, we do have one other talk remaining, uh, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, that is Zohar Bakar, Zohar, you're there. So uh, before you sign off, uh, Said, I will ask uh, Dr. Professor Farid Masood Gondal to just say hello to you. Uh, you probably yeah. remember Khalid, he is the vice yeah, chancellor yeah. of the... Who doesn't remember? <laughs> Dr. Gondal. <laughs> so you have a uh, here now. Thank you very much. Thank you very quickly and then go on to the next talk. We will have a lot of money with you. This is why I entered when I entered. So I just saw a man, I had a spare part. Excuse me, madam. I had a spare part for 30 years. So I asked him to sit with Zayn Bashir. I said, who is the right guy? I said, I have to go to the second class. I said, जब मैं एंटर हुआ तो मुझे सफेद बाल और ऐसे लगा कि जैसे 80 साल के कुछ बुजुर्ग बात कर रहे हैं। इंसिडेंटली जायद शीर, माइसेल्फ, अतर अहमद सईद, डॉक्टर ताबिंगा, वही आता क्लास कर रहे हैं क्लास ऑफ 86, अभी से आठ साल एंड बस क्लास ऑफ 86। तो मुझे कहने लगे कि यार ये तो सईद साल क्लास कर रहे हैं। मैंने फ so we used to call one Sayyid a Sayyid Grey. So I said, this is Sayyid Grey. So Sayyid, I am looking after 30 years. And I am very happy to see 
डॉक्टर सईद अख्तर सईद अख्तर फर्स्ट ईयर सेकेंड ईयर किंग एडवर्ड मेडिकल यूनिवर्सिटी में वॉज नोन एज आ सईद ग्रे क्योंकि उस जमाने में ना बी डी चौरासिया थी ना कोई और अनाटमी की किताब थी हम ग्रेज अनाटमी पढ़ा करते थे और ग्रेज अनाटमी का जो हाफिज था उसका नाम सईद अख्तर था और मुझे अभी तक याद है अभी सईद को याद है कि नहीं कि जो फेशियल नर्व की पांचों ब्रांचेज हैं जब हेड एंड का सेक्शन था तो सईद ने उन पांचों को ठक करके ऐसे डायसेक्ट किया और पूरी क्लास को कहा आगे देख ले तो वेरी ग्लैड टू सी वेरी मच एंड वी इन्वाइट फिजिकली यू टू फातमा या मेडिकल यूनिवर्सिटी या किन एवर जब या पाकिस्तान है जरूर आए यहाँ की स्टूडेंट फैकल्टी बहुत एक जल्द बहुत अच्छी और आई थिंक आज का फंक्शन चारों हाल में हाल इज so if we have uh, zoha stock he will talk about uh, breastfeeding uh, in the rural communities so uh, zoha uh, works for uh, serve with the type which is the uh, the council or the center for academic uh, uh, economic research in pakistan aap sochenge ki economic research ka kya taluk hai health se to actually the main kaam jo hai wo developmental economics hai aur they work uh, in education Uh, and also in health and also in the community so as well everyone apologies that this will take some additional time but i'll try to be quick um, so my name is zoha i am a program manager in research and health at center for economic research in pakistan so just quickly we basically do academic research in different developmental sectors education and like uh, maliha my colleague was earlier talking about education in pakistan and i my work is particularly focused on health uh, the project that i'm talking about today is i i'm sure will be of interest to many people sitting here um, relates to infant feeding and practices of breastfeeding in the rural communities so uh, this is a collaborative research project which is being conducted by which is uh, the implementation is being done here in lahore um, and we're working in rural districts of shekhupura and kasur uh, but the uh, collaboration is with unicef and punjab government health department and then we have uh, lactation consultants economists and research implementation experts from duke university north carolina university and also locally our uh, khan university uh, we're working with some lactation consultants there so just quickly some background about breastfeeding and why it is so important particularly in our context where it relates to other is uh, disease incidents um diarrhea the quality of water etc and we know that uh, nearly 14% of deaths to children less than 24 months could be averted each year with optimal breastfeeding practices and there is significant literature and uh, published research on how breastfeeding can can also sort of improve uh, not only health outcomes but also be a very useful tool in rural areas where other alternatives are not uh, they cannot be afforded and those are also not optimal so in our setting particularly who and uh, UNICEF work closely with the Punjab government to disseminate information about breastfeeding and uh, particularly on early initiation exclusive breastfeeding and then continued breastfeeding. And Pakistan has one of the world's highest neonatal mortality rates and persistently high infant and child mortality rates. So only uh, you can say 20% of infants are breastfed within the first hour and only 48% are exclusively breastfed. according to uh, the latest dhs reports and this of course relates to poor water quality and other traditional beliefs that i'll also talk about 
So we're working in the community and the project relates closely to Pakistan's Lady Health Worker Program, which is an extensive um, uh, workforce operating publicly in uh, the rural facilities where they're providing clinical services, health education, and also engaged in community mo uh, mobilization. So each health worker has an area of 1,500 uh, people, and she conducts approximately 60 household visits per week. And um, young mothers, for young mothers, for pregnant women, they're also the first point of contact for any nutritional needs and also other uh, family planning services, etc. as well. And so in 2018, UNICEF and Government of Punjab rolled out a major initiative to increase breastfeeding rates uh, through pregnancy education provided by health workers. And so our study, which it was initiated in January 2020, we were looking at um, these two districts and we conducted several interviews with health workers and also interviews with some government health officials, pediatricians, uh, gynecologists, and also UNICEF country representatives just to understand the needs of the community and how we can improve breastfeeding given this extensive lit literature that we see, what is the need in Pakistan, uh, what are the critical traditional improvements and knowledge that we can perhaps provide to facilitate and uh, improve the uptake. And so we've continued field work since then and there are a lot of uh, some of the research findings I'll share today and also talk about the extensive project that we're working on. So some key barriers that came up during the qualitative research was that there are some traditional beliefs that are particular when it comes to breastfeeding. Um, there are beliefs, especially when when there's a, there has been a death of the child in a household, uh, there's strong family members' preference for feeding again for against breastfeeding, and particularly their beliefs such as where the mother-in-law believes that the breastfeed is poisonous, if the baby gets sick and if the mother has had a previous uh, death of a child, then she would highly discourage the mother to breastfeed um, the subsequent child that's born. And there are also practices and beliefs about the colostrum being dirty and that it should be immediately discarded. More so, there's also a lot of prevalence of pre-lactal feeding and uh, families are often giving cultural feeding once the family has returned home and so these are mostly herbal home remedies that are carried across generation. Secondly, formula marketing is also a huge $900 million uh, industry in Pakistan marketing the formula. As a substitute for mothers, milk has been banned, but enforcement is weak. And this is particularly for children under six months. And uh, there's regulation now to ensure that on advertisements and packaging, there is no child which is less, there's no picture of a child which is less than six months being shown. And thirdly, the use of animal milk as a substitute is also common in rural areas because uh, given that income is a constraint, it's not possible for the families to afford formula. And so the uh, milk that is available at home is just fed to the child. And um, there are WHO guidelines on how animal milk should be if it needs to be fed but of course in these areas that knowledge is not prevalent and so animal milk just as it is prepared for other adults in the home is fed to the child which is of course dangerous and sometimes um, it's also diluted by adding water or cardamom and other things so the, how um why are we talking about the lady health worker here is because all of this education for breastfeeding is being uh, disseminated through health workers. So it's very critical that they are thoroughly um, trained on to breastfeeding practices and they're aware of the traditional barriers that come up. So um, since they're visiting mothers multiple times prenatally and they have been trained by UNICEF, we felt that there was a need to sort of have provide access to them in not just like, you know, um, bigger trainings that happen every few years, but rather provide some guidelines which is which are accessible to them whenever they need, and so uh, they can always have that knowledge. Maybe you know it is something very small, but it's very critical when they're talking to mothers or just sort of engaging with them in counseling sessions. So we needed to 
uh, prepare this training and to have this information access readily available to them in order so in order for them to act and uh, dispel these breastfeeding myths and so we saw um, that in a lot of cases when these HWs are also going to the homes and working with mothers there's also the influence of other family members in the household who will uh, have a strong say in what the child should be fed and what the child maybe is not being fed. And so, uh, especially for young mothers who have less autonomy and less decision-making power, it is very critical that we target other important family members who are making these feeding decisions. And so, um, we need to think about the role of mother-in-laws and the role of the husband in supporting the wife in breastfeeding the child. So therefore, what uh, the work that we're currently doing, and uh, it, it involves a mobile health intervention, which would provide counseling, uh, which would provide these breastfeeding uh, counseling readily available for the LHW. So when they visit these households, they have in their phones an app just like they use WhatsApp, and they're using actively uh, looking at videos, they have an app which talks about, which is sort of uh, structured in a way that they can, whenever they go to a mother, they can pull up relevant materials. And so we have, I talk about the uh, design of the app as well, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide the LHW with a handy tool, which is available to improve her knowledge on breastfeeding, and then also use that tool to uh, ask mothers the relevant questions during the different stages of her pregnancy, which is critical to ensure that ultimately when the child is born, the mother is convinced to breastfeed. So the app is providing timely reminders, it is showing videos for uh, patients, showing positioning, latch, and also dem demonstrating messages of support for early exclusive breastfeeding from role models, especially mother-in-laws. Um, and then we also have built in some clinical algorithms, which will serve as diagnostics and just ask yes or no questions, which they can use to counsel the mother and provide the relevant counseling that's needed. And then another part is also an automatic growth charting, which will uh, just be uh, readily available to the LHW and she can just show on her phone a growth chart to the mother as required to see whether, you know, the child is uh, whether it is normal growth, and in case it's not, then that could be reported and she could be taken to the medical facility. So this is a randomized control design, and we will pilot uh, this mobile app with 350 LHWs. Uh, the randomization will be based on availability of an active LHW who is interested in the study, and also there is sufficient distance between villages and health facilities to avoid the possibility of uh, spillovers. So one treatment group would be getting training uh, without app access, and this training would be led by our Aahan partners, who are lactation consultants. Um, and they actually started the first breastfeeding champions program in Pakistan uh, by training nurses. So they will be conducting this in-person training. The other treatment group will uh, get the in-person training, but will also receive this app. And then we'll have like a separate control group, which will not have um, the dream the So we will evaluate successful baseline randomization by comparing key statistics between the treatment in control villages, for example, rates of early initiation, exclusive breastfeeding, and then also evaluate impact of intervention on other uh, health outcomes. So the currently we have completed the app uh, design and we have extensively tested this out with health workers were actively going in the field, talking to health workers, talking to mothers, trying to understand what their needs are, and then producing, um, and then working according to WHO and UNICEF guidelines to put together relevant, contextually appropriate resources to facilitate the mothers. So um, this, as you can see on the screen, uh, the LHW will have like, a list of patients that she has to see every day and then for each patient there will be there will be particular uh, a particular schedule which will be followed for instance prenatally we will divide particular counseling sessions and particular clinical advice that needs to be given at different stages uh, and then so when the so the app will prompt the lhw to conduct a particular visit at a particular time 
and when she goes in, for instance, this is a prenatal algorithm that will pop up uh, when she asks the mother about whether she has breastfed in the past or not, there would be documented counseling that will show up. For instance, when she clicks benefits of exclusive breastfeeding, the LHW will be guided on how to talk to the mother about critical points. And the app will also have uh, important training videos, which the LHW can use in her own time to enhance her own knowledge. And these are all available in Urdu. Uh, and we, so these are global health media videos, which are uh, produced and also used extensively across the world. So we have translated these in Urdu, and we're working with UNICEF to also produce more that talk about uh, traditional knowledge and how to how to uh, alleviate constraints that women face in our context, particularly around how working women can be supported for breastfeeding, etc. And so there will also be some quizzes and tests that the LHWs can sort of attempt in her own time just to improve her knowledge on these subjects. The app will also provide reminders for the LHW, given the extensive work they're doing in the communities and not just working on breastfeeding, the app will prompt them if it if a checkup is due for a particular patient, and in cases where it uh, requires a medical professional to step in, uh, then, the, then the app will immediately prompt them to uh, refer the patient to the BHU because the symptoms required would actually need like a medical uh, professional and would be outside the ambit of what the LHW does. So uh, for the sir, we will have three surveys before the intervention. We will do an extensive baseline survey. A part of that will also look at the uh, technical, uh, technological literacy of LHWs before we conduct the study, and then we'll also be looking at other breastfeeding knowledge, beliefs, counseling, and then during the intervention, we'll also follow up with LHWs to ensure that the app is of use to them, and if there are any questions about that. And then at the end of the um, study, we will conduct an extensive end-line survey with the LHWs as well as maternal service. Um, we will also be we will also be conducting surveys with other key decision makers in the household, for example, the mother-in-law and the father, just to understand and see whether there's an improvement in the uptake of breastfeeding, whether knowledge, attitudes, beliefs of infant feeding have been, you know, if there's any change there or not. Um, and then we'll also be looking at the administrative data from the M Health app just to see how well uh, the mobile health technology is working in the setting. And we're hopeful about the update, particularly because given recent times, we have seen that these health workers have been trained onto other uh, apps, such as the Dengue app, the COVID app. So they're already using technology in some form. And so we'll continue to uh, monitor the app and see how well the app is being used and whether these videos are being used and how much data collection is being done through them. And so essentially the point is just that we want to improve these norms of modesty, we want to alleviate the misinformation, we want to improve the attention span of the LHWs as well when they are attending these training sessions. Uh, and also one of the mechanisms is also targeting that we want to garner support from important uh, decision makers in the household that impact what the child is fed and the authority of the LHW in the community as well and how well she can engage with family members. So I can go on but just in the interest of time I would like to wrap up here. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to read out. Thank you. Uh, my question is about soft skills. Uh, I want to ask what are the instructional strategies used for soft skills in the West, in the developed countries, and how can we adopt them here? Thank you. I think that's a it's a very relevant question. So we're basically in this context, it's the role of the health worker and now how well she can engage with the community. So all of the work that we're currently doing is coming from you know the needs of our 
health workers locally. So what we've seen is that if you talk to health workers here, तो वो आपको बताएंगे कि जो मदर्स उनकी कम्युनिटी में मैं जाती हूँ, वो मुझे अपने सारे राज और हर चीज मेरे साथ शेयर करती हैं। तो I think trust building is a very important factor, and in this case, that's the particular behaviour change that we're trying to target. कि अगर इतना confidence और trust build हुआ का है health worker और mother के दरमियान so she will not just say that 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 she will talk to her peers about it. So any piece of information that is being provided by the LHW is you can say that it just spreads like wildfire in the community. So we are targeting those things and that's why we felt that when we had the initial study, these particular areas that have been clinical aspects like breastfeeding, mastitis, incorporation, निपल पेन वगैरह की चीजें हैं तो जहाँ पे एलएसडब्ल्यू का अपना नॉलेज कम होता है उसके बारे में वो इतनी कॉन्फिडेंस नहीं बात कर पाती तो इसलिए फिर हमने ये टूल्स बनाए हैं कि वो उसका जब अपना नॉलेज स्ट्रॉंग होगा तो वो फिर भी आराम से मदर्स को भी उसी कॉन्फिडेंस से इन चीजों के बारे में बात Soft skills are very relevant to all when they are mother-in-law because they are court incidents of when they are sort of, you know, they are told to just leave their homes because there is there's someone else who interrupts the discussion with the mother. So how did they do it in a very calm way and a calm but also, you know, assertive in a sense that she is giving out the relevant guidance that needs to be provided not only to the mother but also to mother-in-law and separately, the husband said that they have to talk about it, they have to do it, and trust gain. So there are multiple factors that play around. Thank you very much, Zohar. Excellent presentation. Very good question. Thank you. So I think we will conclude this session in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next event, we are running a bit late, so it is half past 11 now, so I think we can take a break and we can meet. So we'll take a quick break of 15 minutes or we will reconvene for the what we have called the first Fatima Dina lecture is This is a group of people who have been born here So I'm so sorry, what we'll do is we'll cut the ceremony short with Lina, everybody and we will just take a photograph, is it all right? Certificate of all doctors. Please, certificate. Today, finally, the jariya, the batches, all doctors should say, please. Give the guy a rest, the guy a home. Aslan, be checked. Abhi, 15 minute ki break ke baad, very important lecture on robotics and you. Jis pe, Saji ka unit 2, manage karega sara haal, और पेन ड्रॉप साइलेंस के बाद वो लेक्चर हम चलेंगे पंद्रह मिनट मिला है फिर कब कब भी एंड फिर हम दोबारा वहाँ वापस आएंगे अभी जो स्पीकर्स हैं तो सिर्फ के के बाद चाय पीने के बाद दोबारा हम वापस to take the certificates of Dr. Ahmed And I also request uh, to take a certificate of uh, Miss Malia Hamid. And Professor Dr. Zahir Bashir. And uh, Dr. Saeed Akhtar. <laughs> and for she distribution, um, for uh, FJ Chair, G. Ms. Zoha Bakar, Abhi Kumar. And the certificate in.
started uh, for sheet distribution MJJF Professor uh, Kamran Khalid Sarif Kudin. Sir Kamran Khalid. For guest year, Madam Munaz, Professor Munazza Iqbal. For UK chair, Dr. Varda Tari Chupi. For student chair, uh, Amna Masood. And sir, uh, last for mine. And the last sheet is for Dr. Athasi. Now this is the responsibility of all of us. Andhra Minute quickly or Sari Art to us. And the main responsibility is to answer. Avas, Aap or Arsalam. Andhra Minute ke baad, everybody should be in the auditorium. Thank you. The session, this is a little bit of pressure to tell you. Background is here at the So please be seated uh, now so that we can start the proceedings. Uh, in the meanwhile, I will ask our guests, the whole panel, uh, to come and take their seats on the stage. Uh, Dr. Saima, uh, Saima Bismillah Rahim. I'm Dr. Saima and I welcome you all in this fifth session of Medical Scientific Conference 2023. So to, that, to start this uh, session formally, I would like to request all the panelists, I would invite them one by one, First of all, I will invite our worthy chief guest, Professor Mehmood Ayaz, to please come to the stage and take the seat. Worthy Vice Chancellor, Professor Khaled Masood Godal, sir, please come to the stage. Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Kamran Khaled Khwaja, sir, please take the seat. Principal Fatma Nina Medical College, Professor Noreen Ahmad, please have a come. Kamaka Chair, Dr. Athar Sain, sir, please take the seat. <laughs> Professor Bikis Shabbi, Director QEC and Dean Nursing and Allied, Madam, please come to the seat. Dr. Hiba Heather, and Dr. Varda Shafi. <laughs> Okay, so to, to start today's session, I would hand over the dice to Dr. Athar Singh. Thank you very much. I'm going to make a little background the lecture that we are going to do. So this is, we have called this the first part. Recording in progress. So we've called it the first part. Then I invited a distinguished guest lecture. Uh, ये काफी कॉमन है नॉर्थ अमेरिका में और यूरोप में कि वो लोग जिनके आउटस्टैंडिंग अचीवमेंट्स हैं प्रोफेशनल या किसी और फील्ड में उनको यूनिवर्सिटी बुलाती हैं उनसे बात करती हैं आमतौर पर लेक्चर की ड्यूरेशन एक या दो घंटे की होती है सो इट इज नॉट फॉर द वीक हार्टेड लेकिन उसमें मकसद ये होता है कि आप लोग उनकी अचीवमेंट्स सुने उनकी जिंदगी से उनकी अचीवमेंट से इंस्पायर हों और उनको एज अ रोल मॉडल देखें कि वो आपके लिए सूटेबल है या नहीं तो 
hopefully uh, i uh, i sincerely hope ke ye silsila jaari rahega kal humne first umayya invited guest lecture karwaya tha uh, sorry monday ko ke hi mein mai kar raha hu ayaz sahab party ko team but uh, it was a fantastic opportunity to interact with world leaders in the field us lecture mein jo speaker ke kalam tha wo mai tumse mai uthe पाकिस्तान ग्रेजुएट और नर्स से पढ़ी है जब आई थी एक्चुअली जब उन्होंने स्टार्ट किया था अपना करियर इंग्लैंड में तो हमारे हॉस्पिटल से किया था सो आई हैव दी गुड फॉर्च्यून एंड गुड लक टू बी मेंटर हर एंड इन नॉट हर टू बी एनएचएस नेशनल सर्विस उसके बाद शी वेंट ऑन टू अचीव ग्रेट हाइट्स एज अ ट्रेंड एज अ सर्जन इवेंचुअली सी शी स्पेशलाइज्ड इन कोरोरेक्टोसर्जरी फॉर पाकिस्तानी रोबोटिक कोरोरेक्टोसर्जन एज आई एम अवेयर एक्चुअली आई एम फैमिलियर विद एनी अदर फीमेल audience. So, uh, Arun, are you there? And can you hear me? And can Gee. you see me? Uh, so, if it is Gee, possible, sorry, sorry, Arun, is it possible for you to uh, put on the video so that we can see you as well? Gee, uh, just give me two minutes. Um, video will be chilly, but I will I will uh, start it as soon as possible. But we can have a conversation. Chhi, but I I don't know if you are there, but maybe the first day something new that I think or interview that I saw. Yeah, yeah. काफी काफी ज़्यादा लोग थे कुछ important शख्सियत भी थे जो अभी stage पे हैं आप देखने होंगे आप आप भी थे panel में तो काफी interesting interview था. और बहुत अच्छा लगा कि यू नो आप ही थे और रिप्रेजेंट कर रहे थे आप किस योर सामने लेकिन फीडिंग इन आप सो यू कैन स्टे कोल्ड टू द माइक एंड आई यू सिल ऑन योर मोबाइल डिवाइस यस आप इस अटैक से हेड कोल्ड या ओके सो ये बताइए कि आप जब इंग्लैंड आए तो आपका ख्याल था कि आप मेडिसिन करेंगे या सर्जरी करेंगे आप आई थी दुबई से यूएई से डू यू रिमेम्बर दैट यस आई रिमेम्बर दैट वेरी वेल सो उस वक्त मसला ये था कि होम ऑफिस ने जो के यूके का इमिग्रेशन डिपार्टमेंट है उन्होंने वीजा रूल्स बड़े मॉडिफाई कर दिए थे एंड दे वर एक्चुअली क्वाइट ड्रैकोनियन जरा उसके बारे में बताइए कि आपको कैसे दो हफ्ते का वीजा मिलता था एक बार की जी जी ये ऐसे चैलेंजेस हैं जो सिर्फ शायद हम ही समझ आती है जो यहाँ पे यूके में ट्रेनिंग है ये डॉक्टर्स हैं उनको यू नो उनको उनको ये बात नहीं समझ आती थी कि आप पाकिस्तानी पासपोर्ट होल्डर हैं आपको वीजा चाहिए ये एप्लीकेशन प्रोसेस है एंड जो काफी रिगुलर्स हैं और काफी ज्यादा रूल्स हैं फाइनेंशियल कॉस्ट भी काफी ज्यादा है बेशक आप टॉप टॉपर हैं मेडिकल स्कूल के आप सबसे पाकिस्तान के टॉपर हैं फिर भी अगर आपको वीजा चाहिए और वीजा एप्लीकेशन प्रोसेस में चीजें पूरी नहीं हो तो आपको वीजा नहीं मिलता फिर आप वीजा नहीं मिलता फिर आप क्योंकि नहीं प्रैक्टिस कर सकते तो काफी रिग्रेस सा है काफी वीजा एप्लीकेशन प्रोसेस होता है और शायद मेरे लक्ष्य में थोड़ा सा मैं इस बारे में बात करूँ और डिटेल्स बता सकूँ 
लेकिन इट समथिंग दैट इज अ चैलेंज जो सिर्फ हमें ही समझ आती है जो जिसको जिन जो जो गुजरता है इन चीजों से तो इट्स डेफिनेटली समथिंग क्वाइट इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस एक और बात यदि स्ट्राइल सी पिकन टर्न अ वीडियो ऑन अरूच लेकिन इस दौरान एक और प्रॉब्लम ये थी जो कि हर सारे जूनियर डॉक्टर्स जो के शुरू करते हैं अपना करियर यूके में वो फेस करते हैं कि शुरू में जॉब लेनी पहली जॉब लेनी बहुत मुश्किल होती है और उसके लिए आपको ऐसी जॉब्स मिलती हैं जो कि आंतों पर पॉपुलर होती हैं आपको मुख्तु अरसे की जॉब मिलती हैं तो दैट वॉज अ चैलेंज एंड आई थिंक यू आर तो आपका क्या उस वक्त एक्सपीरियंस था आपको याद है जी इट इज इट इज सर्टली चैलेंजिंग लेकिन यू बी आई हैव सीन दिस जॉब मार्केट इज सर्टली इंप्रूव्ड इन द एनएचएस और आपको अगर आपको कोई स्पेसिफिक एरिया में भी रिस्ट्रिक्शन है तो किसी भी हॉस्पिटल में अगर आप एंट्री ले लें किसी भी स्पेशलिटी के पेशेंट को आप कोई चूज स्पेशलिटी नहीं है उसके बाद आप फिर एट लीस्ट आपका यूरिन का रिपोर्ट इज डोर एक्सीलेंट तो रूल कि हम अब वीडियो प्ले करेंगे थोड़ी देर में जो कि हमने रिकॉर्ड की हुई है पहले से तो वो अपने बारे में खुद भी आपको बताएंगी लेकिन इनकी बैकग्राउंड कुछ तो हमने कवर कर ली फिलहाल ये कंसल्टेंट को रेकल सर्जन है नॉर्थ ईस्ट ऑफ इंग्लैंड में और इनके इंटरेस्ट जो क्लिनिकल हैं एजुकेशनल हैं मोस्टली इनको रेक्टल कैंसर और एबडोमिनल वॉल हेरिया सर्जरी और ये मिनिमली इन्वेसिव सर्जिकल टेक्निक्स और इनोवेशन पर काम करती हैं और जो हमारा हॉस्पिटल है वहाँ पे अस्पतालों को ट्रस्ट कहते हैं कॉमन एरियम में क्योंकि उनको ऑटोनोमस बॉडीज बना दिया हुआ है तो हमारे ट्रस्ट में वो लीड है रोबोटिक सर्जरी की और इन्होंने एक मल्टी डिसिप्लिनरी प्रोग्राम भी इम्प्लीमेंट किया है और बाकी अपने सर्जिकल कॉलिग्स को जो कि ज़्यादातर यू के बॉर्न एंड ब्राइट और एजुकेटेड हैं उनको भी ट्रेन किया है और इसके अलावा इन्होंने इंटरनेशनल सर्जिकल कोर्सेज से भी रन किए हैं कर रहे हैं ट्रेनिंग डेज रन करती रहती हैं और स्टूडेंट्स के लिए शी सर्जिकल मैन टॉर एंड शी एक्चुअली रिसीव द एन एच एस लीडरशिप अकेडमी अवॉर्ड विद कम्प्लीटेड डिग्री इन मेडिकल एजुकेशन एंड शी इज पार्ट ऑफ दिनेटिव कमेटी फॉर द की ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सच एज ब्रिटिश सोसाइटी एंड एसिड एसिड क्या होता है um as it is uh, associations of surgeons in training right okay excellent so good to see you or uh, we can now see you and hear you so uh, i'm not sure aapko kitni der baad jana hai aapka aapki duration kitni hai aapki lecture ki jada aapko jo humne record kiya hua it's about 40 gt it's about 40 minutes aur uh, ye hai ki main on call to on call mein ye hota hai ki aap sabah sab 8 baje jo hai na sare ikatthe hote hain hand over mein और इमरजेंसी जितने भी केसेस हैं वो डिस्कस करते हैं एंड सम पेशेंट्स हैव टू गो टू थिएटर तो वो है थोड़ा सा मुझे हाफ एन आवर तक जाना होगा ठीक है लेकिन इफ आई एम अवेलेबल उसके बाद आई ट्राई टू लॉग इन दैट्स फाइन मे बी वी कैन अटेंड योर हैंड ओवर व्हाट आर व्हेन यू आर देयर ऑन योर मोबाइल फोन बट गुड टू सी यू एंड व्हाट विल सेट अप नाउ विल प्ले द रिकॉर्डिंग एंड देन इफ यू कम बैक यू वी कैन थैंक यू रोज जी ठीक जी थैंक यू ये रिकॉर्डिंग के लिए कमाल है
where uh, I am right now and the journey that has um, preceded me over the last several years. They say to be a surgeon, you need to be a, uh, have the eye of a hawk, the heart of a lion, and the hands of a lady. I certainly have the hands of a lady and the heart of a lion and the eye of a hawk, and I hope I can show you how all of you can also become a successful surgeon. And everyone uh, in this audience has that capability in you. Uh, about me first, so to say I was a born doctor is not an understatement. Ever since I was little, I knew I wanted to become uh, you know, a medical doctor. I didn't really know what kind of specialty, but I just knew that it was an area that I was very passionate about and I was very interested in. I did the usual uh, you know, schooling and I did everything I could to make sure that I had a portfolio that was geared up for applications to uh, different medical schools. And I was fortunate enough to enter into um, our medical college in Rawalpindi, which was a very competitive um, interview process. But I'm really uh, pleased that I had to spend, you know, four and a half, five years of excellent um, medical training at that time. It was a really, really um, different experience, certainly, to be part of an army institute. However, it gave me a lot of other skills uh, outside of medicine, you know, particularly about discipline, respect. Um, and you know, dealing with different kind of um, troubleshooting, different kind of problems, shall I say. Um, it gave me a lot of resilience, and within medicine, I had a variety of experiences in different specialties. I rotated on medical wards, surgical wards, maternity wards, and got to experience a variety of clinical conditions as well. And this gave me a good broad base to complete my medical school. And I certainly encourage you at this time, while you're there, to try and experience as much gain as much knowledge in different specialties and learn from a variety of people who are have uh, a lot to share and a lot of experience. Um, after medical school, I was um, you know, thinking about what to do and where to go. And the thing that turned you know, the, the corner for me in terms of what specialty was uh, when one of my seniors asked me to join an appendicectomy operation. I hadn't really seen it before. I hadn't really done it before. But uh, there I was, standing opposite a patient um, and performing a appendicectomy. I completed that very well and I could see immediately afterwards the patient went home and they were very grateful and I realized wow this is an exciting specialty. So there and all you know it was a turning um, corner for me and I decided yes the surgical route is the option for me. And then in order to pursue this I you know the world is really your oyster. I looked around and you know I wanted to pursue postgraduate training and certainly, you know, you could consider going anywhere in the world, really. Um, I kind of narrowed it down to four places. Um, so, uh, UK, which you didn't have to give your PLAB exams. Um, Australia, you have to give AMC exams. And obviously, your assembly, which is slightly quite a long, uh, very long route to three different exams. I certainly could have stayed in Pakistan. However, my family were not... Uh, residing in Pakistan at the time, so I didn't really uh, want to stay there, away from my family. Having said that, I decided still to go away, and uh, I decided to go down the UK route. Um, how did I make my decision was is quite hard. Um, there are different factors to you know decide where you would go for postgraduate training. Certainly where your family are based, I think, is a very, very important factor. You certainly will be away from your family if you go, and that can be quite hard to deal with at times. Um, uh, where you know the world you go will, will uh, depend on, say, what passport you hold, what visa requirements you had. I certainly had to apply for different kinds of visas, which all had various uh, costs associated with it, various processing times, uh, and there was a bit of uncertainty and predictability about that side of um, things. And um, all of these obviously costs, you know, there are certain costs associated with it. Any exams that you do, any traveling, accommodation. These applications, they all have a cost attached to them. So it's something that has to be factored in into the timing of when uh, you can pursue postgraduate training abroad. So um, I, you know, I got my got myself together, my family behind me, my friends behind me. I got the information for uh, traveling to the UK, and I set my set my marks on obtaining postgraduate surgical training in uh, the UK. Um, in order to do so, I will, you know, you have to be able to practice medicine in a different country, and every country has their own medical council that governs the practice of all uh, healthcare professionals. So in the UK, it's the General Medical Council, 
Um, and anyone who's interested in practicing and getting registered or having a license to practice, I would highly encourage you to visit the website. After medical school, you, if you want to enter into UK, and you have to you know, complete the PLAB tests. These are professional and linguistic assessment board tests, which have two parts to them. And a lot of information is available on the Delivery Council website, and I've got the website link there below if you'd like to read. My experience was I had to give PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. PLAB 1 is about 180 MCQs, which is one to first questions. Um, there are centers uh, in Islamabad and Karachi where this can be given in uh, house. However, for PLAB 2, this is 16 OSCE scenarios, and this has to be uh, given in the UK. There are special uh, PLAB visas that can be uh, applied for in order to come and give this uh, uh, test. And this, is, this is the route that I took. So I completed um, Plan 1 while I was doing my house job in um, CMH and MH at uh, Rawalpindi. And then once I was completed, I um, came to Manchester, UK on a Plan visa to give my Plan 2 exams. And once you complete these two exams successfully, you can apply for um, a license to practice with the General Medical Council. And then you can get a provisional or a full license depending on your level of experience. And that would allow you then to apply for jobs and start practicing in the UK. There are uh, some prerequisites, so a lot uh, of us have had to give um, an English uh, language test such as IELTS, uh, which is very straightforward and uh, just needs to be completed. Um, now, this is a, a sad example of a training pathway in the UK. Uh, after you complete university, you have to do uh, two years of foundation years, which is a house job kind of equivalent. And then you enter uh, your core and higher specialty training for a specific specialty. So say if you want to do general surgery, if you want to do plastic surgery, if you want to do cardiothoracic surgery, neurosurgery, all the different types of specialty trainings have slightly different years of training pathway, but overall this is the general uh, scheme. Once you finish your specialty training, you'll have a CCT, which is to complete you know, your training. And that allows you to become a consultant where you can practice independently. <coughs> During this pathway, there can be a variety of changes and flexibility uh, to suit your individual circumstance. So, say you wanted to have experience in a certain area, you can take time out to do that. You can take time out to trade in a certain area. If you wanted to do research, you can uh, do an MD or PhD. If you want to be an entrepreneur and learn how to learn uh, do new technologies or learn different techniques, there's a lot of flexibility in the system to allow us to do that. So I'll break each of these pathways slightly in a bit more detail for your understanding. Um, after I did my house job, I applied for my foundation program, and I used the first year house job that I did, uh, and I added a year on, so I essentially did a, did a completely two-year program. But if you were to start from the beginning, it would be an F1, foundation year one, or foundation year two job, so that's two-year rotations. Um, each year has all, uh, around a four month uh, on average rotations in different specialities, uh, including the medical field, the surgical field. You can rotate the community uh, specialties as well. And there's a good variety of different types of um, specialities, and it's, it's quite useful to, uh, to, to experience this because sometimes you may not be sure as to what kind of speciality you want to do, and when you actually experience it, you kind of have a better understanding of the, of the, the nature. Um, after that, you can enter into core surgical training. Uh, this is a national application. Um, with with the moment, the competition ratio is about you know three to one. So for every three applicants, uh, there is a one successful post. So um, it's fairly competitive. And it's a two-year program. Uh, this is equivalent to an SHO or a senior health officer. So you're not quite into your your dedicated specialty training, but you're focusing on a certain surgical. Uh, intense rotation, which is about four to six months in different surgical specific uh, specialities. So, for instance, I did general surgery, I did trauma and orthopedic, I did plastic surgery and intensive care during that time. And then the second year tends to be a 12 month of your set specialty. So, if you want to do general surgery, you'll be to do 12 months in general surgery alone. This is quite a very uh, quite a useful way to really get in and understand a lot more of the nuances 
of the title of a surgical specialty you're interested in. So I did the 12 months of general surgery, and at that time I was quite uh, enthusiastic about pursuing colorectal surgery, and I found that very interesting and had a lot of different avenues and different um, experiences that I was really excited about. So once you finish your core surgical training, you, during this time, have to complete um, a, an MRCS examination. This is applied to the intercollegiate exams um, and run by the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, this is a, it's basically a, a sort of marker, a benchmark, to say that you can be a, you know, uh, an appropriately trained uh, surgical uh, registrar who can perform common surgical procedures and has a basic understanding of general and the wider specialties. This again encompasses two parts. Part A is a written paper, can be given in anywhere in the world, and part B is an OSCE or a face-to-face -face clinical assessment via type style uh, examination that has to be given in set centers. So once you complete this, you apply to um, higher surgical training. This is again a national competitive application process and I have put on the websites for each of these training pathways for you to have a look at in more detail. Um, higher surgical training is a minimum of six years uh, for general surgery six years. Um, and during that six years, you rotate between different type of subspecialties. So for instance, I did six year rotation in general surgery. During this time, I had exposure to colorectal surgery, upper GI surgery, hepatobiliary surgery, vascular surgery and breast surgery. So you have a wide experience in general surgery as such. You have to be MRCS uh, positive, so you have to complete your exams to be able to enter this higher surgical training. And it's a competitive portfolio application first, um, where you have to provide evidence for your qualifications, your audits, presentations, teaching and training, and management leadership skills. And it's a central application that's submitted uh, through an online portal where shortlisting occurs and then you'll be invited for an interview which consists of different stations, uh, including a portfolio station, a clinical scenario station, a management station, and an academic station. So this is a pretty much a merit-based application process. So the, the higher merit trainees certainly can enter this pathway. And I was, as well, one of those trainees who was able to successfully come through. Um, there's a lot of flexibility, as I said earlier, in the system, so you're not quite tied down in that six years. You can do a lot more uh, during that time, depending on what you know your individual circumstances are as well, and what, say, the opportunities you come across. Once you complete your higher specialty training, you have to complete uh, the other side of the exit exam. So when to enter higher specialty training, you have to do the MRCS, and to exit, you have to do the FRCS. This is run by the Joint uh, Committee on Intercollegiate Examinations um, and again consists of two papers, Part A is an MCQ paper which is given in a centre in the UK or anywhere in the world now and Part B is an OSCE, Viva style, face-to-face uh, -face examination. Uh, this, is ten this tends to be given just before the, you know, the end of your training pathway uh, once, you've, once you've had all the experience and you're able to sort of if you feel like you can independently work as a consultant, that's when you give this exam. Um, I certainly was fortunate enough to be awarded a distinction in the FRCS, and I was perhaps the first Pakistani female to be awarded a gold medal in this exam. Uh, once you complete all of this, then you've got your certificate of completion of training, which is your CCT, and this is you know time to celebrate and to say that all your years of hard work have paid off, and now you can be an independent practitioner as a surgeon. And obviously, this qualification can take you anywhere around the world if you wish to do so. So certainly, you know, you are uh, on the road to be, you know, an amazing uh, surgeon. And um, there's, there's, there's lots to think about during this time. And I'm, I'm going to sort of dive in a bit more detail about the surgical specialty here. And I suppose what inspires me, uh, and I hope inspires you, is what I'm trying to, to, to showcase in this lecture. Um, anything to do with your hands and work. You know, is, is, is why surgeons like to do this, so they're distinguished by the art of, and craft of their ability to perform surgical procedures or operations. So anybody who likes to do crafts or likes to do, um, use their hands to, to perform procedures or are very, you know, uh, interactive, find, you know, surgery very fascinating. And the history of surgery goes way, way back, you know, there's, there's a lot of different stories and different um, 
anecdotes about where surgery came from and the, the, the evolution of surgery. Uh, where, you know, in the, you know, long time ago, the Egyptians used to perform surgery without any anesthesia, they used to have, you know, people hold out patients and, you know, the, all, the, all the operations they could do would be life or lift threatening and amputation type surgeries. Uh, and, you know, as time progressed, people developed anesthesia, which was the form of uh, chloroform, where they used to, you know, knock the patients out uh, and then perform the surgery really quickly, they didn't have much time. And then, you know, technology developed and now we're able to perform uh, surgeries with the patient under general anesthetic, uh, intubated, ventilated, and safely perform procedures um, as well. It is said that, you know, general anesthetic is, is safer than flying uh, in an airplane or driving a car. So we've certainly come leaps and bounds in our surgical safety uh, and uh, technology as well. There are many fields of uh, surgery that, you know, one may find interesting, you know, be it eye surgery, heart surgery, bone surgery, plastic surgery, transplant surgery, head and neck surgery, and there, you know, colorectal surgery, breast surgery, vascular surgery, I mean, the lists, you know, can go on and say the entire body has a surgical specialty dedicated to its own and you could, you know, if you're interested, really specialize in a certain area over time. There are different types of surgery that are performed, you know, there are surgeries that are where the patient, you know, has open operations, where you have equipment that uh, you directly in contact, I suppose, with the body. Uh, you have keyhole surgery where you operate outside the body and you've got robotic surgery where you are sitting away from uh, the patient's body. Um, and there are very, you know, there are a variety of reasons to do these uh, surgical uh, specialties. And I suppose the center of it all is if you save lives, which is, sounds a bit cliche, but is, is, is true. You know, you patient comes in unwell, you do an operation, and you save the life of that patient. Uh, it's associated with, with you know, high level technical skills, and I'm sure you know if, if any of you in the audience like to play video games or you know use your phone or for a different kind of uh, video games, you would be very technically savvy, I'm sure. Um, there's a lot of knowledge associated with it. It's, you know, you, you, not only do you need to know surgery, you need to know medical knowledge as well. Uh, it's certainly a thrill, and there's a definite personal reward to be able to to, to provide that uh, impact onto a single person's. Uh, life. And certainly, you know, it pays the bills, you know, there is a, a, a associated uh, incentive of that as well. I personally think that surgery is a, perhaps a perfect combination of uh, surgery and medicine where uh, you, you know, do technical skill, but you also have to understand the body's physiology, the post-operative uh, care, the pre-operative care, prehab, and how you can marry medicine uh, as long, you know, as, as uh, with your technical abilities as a surgeon. Even if you do the most technically excellent operation, if you're not uh, perverse with all of the medical knowledge about that patient, so what medications they're taking, whether they're on uh, anticoagulation, uh, whether they're on you know, heart medication, blood medication, is that going to impact your surgical outcome? If they're a smoker, that they're going to be at high risk of wound infections. If they take steroids, they're immunocompromised, and you need to bridge that. Uh, so there's lots of medical knowledge that has to be um, understood while doing surgery. So surgery is not just a technical part, uh, but it's also associated with some general knowledge as well. Um, and to be able to provide, to offer an operation to a patient who comes in, say, with acute appendicitis, and uh, you can diagnose that uh, very easily, with, you know, a patient has pain in the right side of the abdomen, very tender, their bloods show a raised inflammatory markers, and you take them to the theater and have a look at the got appendicitis, and you take the appendix out and they're pulled the same day. Uh, be it that, or be it say the patient comes with severe upper abdominal pain with peritonitis, and they've got a perforated ulcer, you're able to take them to the theater, close the hole where that ulcer is, and they are home and dry within a few days. If you are uh, see if you if you are you know on an acute uh, take and you can see a patient who's got uh, you know a, a limb that looks like this, the picture on the bottom left of your screen and you recognise this immediately as a limb acute limb ischemia and you're able to take this patient to the theatre, unclog the vessels and that black foot turns pink. And you know apart from the emergency scenarios when you're doing your elective practice, if a patient comes to me and they've got a change in their bowel habit. Um, and I perform a colonoscopy on them and I can see that there's a tumor in the left side of the bowel 
and I check that they don't have any distant metastases, I can offer an operation where I can remove that section of the bowel and uh, take the cancer away from them and cure them of that cancer and could give them a good long-term survival. So these are the, some examples of how you know, performing operation can really revolutionize a patient's uh, journey. Um, for, for all those who say, oh, do I really have to be excellent in my technical skills? Certainly there's a lot of uh, you know, training that goes alongside of it. No one expects you to be able to perform a robotic anterior resection on the first day that you enter the surgical department, but it's a gradual training process where you build skills uh, one by one. I'm sure all of you have played a video game where at first you couldn't pass level one, and now you're on level 10 because you continuously practice. So it's pretty much a very similar concept in technical skills. You do require some dexterity, so you know your left hand and right hand do tend to need to work uh, quite well independently. Uh, it's important to have good hand-eye coordination. You need to be able to use instruments in both hands and different types of instruments. Some are long instruments, some are short instruments, some have different buttons attached to them. And it's really important for us uh, surgeons to understand each instrument separately. Many times in the operation you put your hand in an instrument that you may not be familiar with, but uh, you need to be able to learn how to use that instrument and improve your knowledge on that as well. There's a lot of technology, which I'll delve on in the next few slides, uh, in general surgery that has really started to change the landscape of, uh, of, of surgery. And certainly, you know, there's a lot of mental stimulation associated with all these technical skills. It can be quite uh, draining sometimes, it can be quite long hours and long procedures, and it's certainly, again, something that you will build up as you practice and progress. So, I mean, the future of surgery is a combination of, uh, you know, wider collaboration, innovative technology, and really bringing together all of these developments to try and better our patients' outcomes. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide patients with uh, surgical options that give them the success of uh, surgery, but also minimizing the morbidity and getting them back to a full recovery as soon as possible. So previously, gallstones, as you all may know, is a very common general surgical presentation where gallstones form the gallbladder and the patient has been recolic and they get severe pain every time they eat food and this can be quite debilitating. If they're very symptomatic, we can offer an operation where we take the gallbladder out, which is a cholecystectomy. And previously, you know, we used to perform this operation uh, uh, with an open technique, and they, this would leave the patient with uh, a horrible, you know, very long scar, and they've been hospital for several days with pain, and these scars could get hernias, they can have complications, and they don't really get back to their normal activity very quickly. Uh, evolution of surgery has led to laparoscopic surgery, where a lot of these procedures are performed um, by insufflating the abdomen or filling the abdomen or the peritoneal cavity with air, uh, carbon dioxide, so to be accurate, and two or three different ports are inserted uh, from the outside, and straight instruments are inserted through these ports and we perform the procedure. Here's a short video of my registrar performing this operation. As you can see, uh, the view uh, is, is, is quite magnified. On the background, the pink brown is the liver, and on the front is the gallbladder. And that's Carlos trying that, that that's being dissected. Um, you can see that there's quite precision in terms of the type of procedures that are being performed. And if there's any bleeding, you can also put a swab in there and it's very safe to do so. The cystic artery and the cystic ducts are clipped uh, very accurately, and uh, the gallbladder then has been dissected off the liver bed. Again, you can see the patient uh, is, you know, uh, it's very normal size nothing really exciting about that. Uh, the gallbladder is put in a bag and removed. So that entire operation is done through three, four small little cuts and the patient goes home the same day. So this is what the, the incisions look like afterwards. So not only do they have small incisions, they have quicker recovery, they have less pain, they can be done as a day case and then they carry recover quicker and they go back to their normal activities as well. And this concept applies to a variety of procedures, so we no longer do open appendicectomies uh, in the UK. 99% of procedures are performed uh, laparoscopically. Even the difficult appendicectomies, we prefer to perform laparoscopically because we can see better, and you know, even if there's problems, we can deal with them laparoscopically. 
Uh, as well as in the vertex scenario, in the picture on the right, you can see a laparotomy scar. Laparotomy scars are associated with significant uh, morbidity, uh, including surgical site infections, long-term incisional hernias, um, and to try and combat that, we try and use many invasive procedures, uh, even in emergency settings. So if someone comes in with small bowel obstruction due to a band, uh, we're able to do this uh, laparoscopically. Uh, if someone has a perforated ulcer, uh, we are able to do laparoscopically and so forth. So all of these progressions and evolutions of the surgery are directly impacting patients in a positive way. And this isn't stopping uh, here. So there's a lot of development in uh, the surgical, specifically the general surgical field, on the use of artificial um, intelligence, um, where we can use AI to help diagnose uh, different types of uh, surgical conditions. We can uh, use artificial intelligence in our endoscopy, where polyp detection rate has been doubled. Uh, we can use uh, artificial intelligence to help uh, stratify patients' risks for different kinds of pathologies. And we're also using it in research to help us understand different pathologies uh, better. Um, we also have virtual and augmented reality, which helps specifically in training. So we're able to use this tool to uh, allow our trainees to understand the operations better. And we're also using it to help uh, understand the patient's anatomy better. So particularly for me, I've had an interest in seeing how we can use uh, augmented reality to to look at CT scans for patients who have bowel cancer and understand the vascular anatomy better. So we can use uh, AR to uh, superimpose the uh, vascular anatomy onto bowel during an operation to help us identify the tumor. So robotic surgery is certainly, you know, uh, is here to stay in uh, uh, in the UK. In the last 18 months, we've seen a significant increase in the use of robotics uh, in a variety of specialties, but particularly general surgery. We are performing more and more cases robotically uh, as well. And it's certainly an interest and a passion of mine. Um, I can see the direct benefits to the patients with robotic assisted surgery. The robot platform is comprised of a console where you can sit unscrubbed, not away from the patient, and you can have a cup of coffee or tea next to yourself, and you can perform the operation that way. Um, you are uh, sitting in a console that has a, a 3D HD-like view of the anatomy, and your hands are in a controller that uh, control the instruments that are attached to the patient. Your hands and feet have to move together, so the, there are pedals on the, on, the, on the floor of the robot that allows us to uh, you know, use energy devices and control the camera. Uh, while you're sitting in there, your hands go on these little uh, joysticks, and they provide 3D uh, endo wrist articulation for 270 degrees. So whereas your laparoscopic instruments are straight instruments, robotic instruments tend to be endo wristed, which means they can move just like a human wrist and have a good degree of motion. This allows us to perform surgery with very high precision. We can see the uh, planes very well and they have the less tissue trauma. So as you can see here in the video, I'm sat on a console. The head is uh, seeing the anatomy through the viewer, and my hands are controlling the instrument that uh, is attached to the patient, uh, and these are the robotic arms that perform uh, this procedure directly controlled by me. So in no way is this independent, there's no way this is automatic, um, it is just an advanced tool that helps us perform difficult surgeries better. And um, uh, not only that, it gives us a lot of enhanced technology, so here, um, I'll show you a video where we're performing a bowel resection. So we're taking, removing a section of the bowel from a patient who has a bowel cancer. And um, now we would uh, re you know, join the two ends of the bowel, which is performing anastomosis. And in order to perform a safe anastomosis, we want to ensure that the blood supply to the remaining bowel is healthy and um, you know is uh, has is is able to heal, and they would, there are less chances of an anastomotic leak. And in order to do that, we can test the blood supply with various methods. And one of the methods is using ICG, which is a green dye that's injected intravenously and it lights up the part of the bowel that has good blood supply. So I will show you this here. So this is a view 
intraoperative view of the bowel, the col this is the colon, and this is a stapler that is, um, you know, across the bowel. And I was thinking of dividing the bowel along this line, and I'd like to check the blood supply. And as you can see here beautifully, uh, the bowel on the right side of the screen is lighted up quite nicely, whereas the bowel on the left side of the screen hasn't. So this gives me reassurance that I'm going to divide the bowel in a safe place, and so this will perform a safe anastomosis. Um, and also we can use this technology to perform anterior sections. An anterior section is where uh, there is a tumor uh, in the rectum, and we need to remove the left side of the colon, and in order to do that, we need to divide the draining lymphovascular pedicle, which is the inferior mesenteric artery, and this connects to the left colon. And in order to do that, we can see here, this is a view of, um, of the abdomen on the left side. This is the small bowel in the left corner of the screen, and we've got two robotic instruments that are performing the operation. And underneath here, you can see this is the aorta, covered with just a bit of adventitia, and this is the inferior mesenteric artery that connects to uh, the origin of the aorta. And above here, you can see this is part of the left side of the colon. So the view that you get with the robot is very, very high definition. You can see each of the planes very well. As you can see, the left hand is lifting the inferior mesenteric artery up, and the right hand is pushing the tissues down. The tissue that you can see in the back are the uh, gonadals and the IEX. And you can also draw on the screen, which is quite useful when I'm training my trainees. And I can say to them, you know, divide the tissue here, uh, rather than sort of vague instructions, they can actually understand where exactly they need to go. So it's a very useful tool for us to try and, um, uh, you know, train, and also for our for outcomes, our patients, this is a fantastic um, method. And as certainly for us, all of our colorectal operations and hernia operations I perform on a robotic platform, and we have seen that there's significant improvements in their post-operative outcomes as well. And you know, and, and the reason that this is all fantastic and great is because of the people and the patients that we come across. Uh, you know, they're from all walks of life. So, you know, they're from all ages, cultures, careers. And even if you were, you know, your small little gesture of performing a sur surgical procedure on them or diagnosing them or treating their surgical pathologies, and uh, their gratitude and appreciation goes a long way, be it through just a, a humble thank you, be it through cards or, you know, um, letters. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of reassurance that you get that you're doing, you know, you made a significant impact on an individual person's uh, life and a simple smile and thank you is what makes all of these efforts and, you know, uh, uh, difficulties at times uh, worth it. And, you know, this is not without a team, you know, surgery is a huge, huge team sport. Uh, they are very, uh, you know, there's a variety of um, people that are involved in the uh, surgical team. You can see here, this is my robotic team. Um, on the left uh, of me, uh, you know, is is, a, is my robotic coordinator and senior nurse. She is responsible for running the theater on a day-to-day -day basis. She ensures that all the equipment is uh, up and running and is, is working. She's ensuring that everybody knows what they're doing in the theater environment. And the team around her are supporting her. So they're also helping making sure that, uh, you know, the, the covers are stocked, we have the appropriate instruments available, uh, that, you know, the floors are clean, the bins are emptied, and, you know, there's so many tasks in theatre that need to be done, and, and the entire team work together to ensure that that's the case. And, of course, I could not do this without an anesthetist, so a colleague on the right is my uh, anesthetic colleague, and they ensure that the patients have a safe anesthesia, uh, they are, you know, well anesthetized during the operation, they're no concerns from that side. If they require any preoperative uh, optimization or prehab, then my anesthetic colleagues will ensure that the patient's as fit as possible as well to, to undergo uh, major surgery. So you know it's a huge team effort, and you know there's a lot of collaboration in surgery, and you work as a team to to directly influence a set person's uh, or patient's outcome. So you know there's a lot of uh, joy and reassurance. And, you know, we, we really appreciate working in a team. And if you're kind of the person who likes to work in big teams, uh, that surgery is definitely a specialism for you. You know, I've, I've said a lot of the great stuff about uh, being, you know, a surgeon. But, you know, with that comes some trials and tribulations. It's certainly, you know, a long road. It's a long journey. It's not, um, a, you know, it's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon. So you do 
uh, pace yourself through the several years. You do carry on with the, all the other activities in your life during this time, but it certainly you know, it takes time to get to where you want to be. There are times in surgical environments where it's a high pressure situation where you know, time is of the essence. Uh, you need to make quick decisions, fast decisions. But what's great about the surgical environment is because it's so team-based approach that you always have help on hand. There's a lot of people around you, there's a lot of support around you, and you're never really on your own, although you are, you know, you feel like sometimes that the situation is quite high pressure, but everybody comes together and you make the best of the situation you have. It's certainly, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of guts, so if, um, uh, if that's something that, you know, you're not very comfortable with, uh, then, you know, it, there is definitely that associated with the surgical specialties. And yeah, it's a, it's, it takes a lot of determination and hard work, but I'd say that about any specialty that you do, even, even if it's not a surgical specialty, you have to be determined and you have to persevere, and any trials and tribulations that come across, you have to overcome it if, you know, you're going to be successful in that. Um, and it's not really pertaining to surgery, but uh, any, any specialty that you do, you still have to undergo all the, uh, the, the struggles that come with it. So, you know, my day during my surgical training, you know, this is a map of the northeast of England. I used to work in all of these hospitals for six to 12 months at a time when I was doing my training. But now I only work in uh, Gateshead NHS Hospital, which is right in the middle of the, the map that you can see here. So this is where I work on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I do a variety of uh, tasks. Um, I do endoscopy, which is uh, looking for bowel cancers and removing colon polyps and diagnosing various conditions such as hemorrhoids, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticular disease, and uh, all the pathologies that are associated with the lower GI tract. I spend a lot of time in the operating theatre, as you'd expect. I do a lot of the ward rounds, the clinical work, and I have regular outpatient clinics where I see the patients who they come from their diagnosis of bowel cancer. And if it's not bowel cancer, there's all of the benign colorectal work. Uh, that comes with it, such as proctology um, and inflammatory bowel disease. And if I'm not doing all of that, I'm obviously snowed under with a pile of administrative work, which includes, you know, contacting patients about the results, uh, informing them about the, uh, the next appointments that uh, are expected of them, and giving them the results if they've had a bowel cancer. Um, outside of the surgical environment, I, uh, you know, have interest in working with various organizations and it's something that's really, that I'm quite passionate about in terms of teaching and training and there are a variety of all of these organizations that you can all be a part of uh, today. So, um, uh, ASSET is an association of surgeons in training. It is catered for medical students, senior house officers, um, and it's an organization for surgical trainees alone and it's run by surgical trainees. And it's a fantastic organization for everybody to start getting familiar with the surgical environment. There are opportunities to uh, undertake various courses, to participate in conferences, submit abstracts, and so forth. Um, I'm also um, passionate about hernia surgery, so I sit on the education and training committee, and I'm a chair of that. And we're developing a lot of uh, hernia related resources. Uh, it is free to be a member of the British Hernia Society, so I would encourage you all to sign up where this, you can get access to a lot of information about hernia surgery, including information leaflets, uh, free access to webinars, and so forth. If you're interested in colorectal surgery particularly, I would encourage you to consider joining Duke's Club again, which is a free uh, online uh, membership. And it is again a surgical uh, trainee led uh, colorectal society which uh, caters for colorectal trainees uh, or those interested in colorectal surgery. Uh, again, has resources and regular events that could be of use to you. Colorectal surgery in the UK uh, has a body called the Association of Coloproctology of Great Britain and Ireland, and the, this is the sort of the national uh, organization that deals with all colorectal surgeons at consultant and uh, training level and provides recommendations. Uh, there again is a lot of information on the website around resources for common colorectal pathologies and if you're interested in that, you can uh, sign up. So if I'm not doing all of the uh, surgical work in the hospital, outside of the hospital, I do have time for uh, engaging in all of these uh, associations as well. So if you're a surgeon, it doesn't mean that you can't do things outside the surgical environment. Uh, certainly, you, know, you can be participating in various academic work as well. 
um, which includes, you know, writing papers, uh, publishing in different journals, if that's something that you're interested in. It's something that can be, you know, done alongside and you don't necessarily have to um, do one or the other. It's something that, you, you know, as you are progressing your training, you will find that you will be enthusiastic about working in different areas of academics. Uh, during your, you know, your surgical training um, and during the course of being a surgeon, you'll develop lots of mentors and friends along the way. Uh, you'll get a lot of advice and, you know, I got a lot of advice from different people about different areas. It may not necessarily be only surgery related. Um, there's a lot of professional socialization and support to facilitate success. So if you're part of any of these organizations, they do mentorship programs that can be a one-to-one -one, uh, with each person to try and help direct the path of their career. And everybody is different, you know, everybody's got different um, experience and different exposure and come from different backgrounds. So all of these uh, mentors and friends are uh, helpful to try and see what best suits you in your individual circumstance. And alongside that, you know, you, you develop hobbies. I mean, I, I don't play uh, football at all, but I don't know why I play football. Uh, but you know, if you've got other hobbies like, you know, drawing or doing artwork, or even if it's just watching movies, there's certainly a lot of time when you, uh, when you are a surgeon to, to engage in all that. Uh, I'm really you know, delighted to be the keynote speaker um, in this conference because uh, there's, you know, there's, there isn't a lot of representation uh, for you know, a woman in surgery. For every eight uh, male surgeon, there's a single female surgeon. Um, and certainly the landscape is changing quite a lot in the UK, particularly and across the world. Uh, and there's a lot more uh, allowance and acceptance uh, and promotion of women in surgery. And it's not something that should be um, taken in as a negative way. It should be something that should be actively encouraged. And all of our uh, peers should encourage women in surgery. Um, and it's something that if you're passionate about, you should be given the opportunity, the equal opportunity to do so. Um, I myself have come across a variety of excellent uh, female uh, colleagues who are you know, who've been inspirational in my journey, and I uh, I hope that you know if I can inspire a single person in this audience to you know if you are already passionate or you have become passionate about uh, being a surgeon, uh, being a woman actually is a you know is a is an advantage because we do possess a lot of uh, excellent skills that are fantastically used uh, as a surgeon. You know, if, if someone says to you, well, what about the flexibility of being a surgeon? You know, again, the world is your oyster. There's a lot of flexibility in a surgeon. You can be, you know, you can be a cancer specialist. You can be an academic surgeon. You can be a professor. You can do teaching training. You can, you know, work less than full time, which is, you know, not working 100% of the week. You can drop down your hours to suit your personal circumstance. You can uh, choose to uh, do part-time clinical work and part-time to do some something else. So like you can become an entrepreneur, you can choose to be just a, you know, a professor, you can uh, choose to just uh, you know, have a good work-life balance by working you know, maybe 50% of the week and the other 50% of the time you're devoting to your uh, family. So certainly the, because there's been an increase in uh, awareness and an increase in understanding about the access and availability for women in surgery, so is the opportunity. So the more that we see each other, the more that we support each other, the more opportunities have come to light. So, you know, being a surgeon certainly requires determination and perseverance. And I would highly encourage everybody to try and experience being, you know, a surgeon. There are barriers that may be, uh, you know, may, that may have been told to you about being a surgeon. But however, when you may experience it, you might not find that these barriers are uh, that much of a problem. And there's nothing more, you know, uh, exciting about being a surgeon than actually making a huge impact into, you know, individual life. And I think that's perhaps the biggest take-home message I'd, I would say to you is that if you're, you know, if you're passionate, if you're uh, enthusiastic about being a surgeon and you have definitely this, you know, a lot of you may have the skills and not even know it. You, the only way to really experience that is to, to rotate to surgical specialties and try it and see how you feel and certainly don't don't give way to any of the barriers that maybe appear to be uh, there in front of you. Uh, I hope I follow, you know I hope that uh, even you know uh, one of you in the audience member is interested in becoming a, a surgeon. Uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, you know talk to you in a bit more detail about any of these individual uh, nuances of being a surgeon. 
and uh, I wish you all the best of luck in the future. And uh, thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, Aruj. Um, that was a uh, total force, I think. Uh, you kept the audience limited completely. So I think we have time uh, now for some questions uh, before Aruj has to go to the board round. Uh, I will invite Professor Mahmoud Ayaz, who is our chief guest for this uh, gathering today as well. And uh, he is the first uh, robotic surgeon uh, in Pakistan, as far as I know, and there are not many more either. So he is, I think, in a very uh, well placed, in a good position to ask some questions uh, about maybe careers, but also about the technical stuff on robotic surgery. Mahmoud? I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I'm not here as a chief guest, I just wanted to learn from Aluj. Aluj, I've seen all the people in the past. I'll tell you that there are two names in Farsi, to rise so she has risen and she's shown not only in pakistan but in uk so aruj pehli thi baat hai ki ਮੈਂ <laughs> Then I switched to general surgery and then I switched to minimal invasive surgery. Or Mere is Safar K uh Ham Safar, uh Mere Sadhana goes he's better than Professor Fan Shikon. Uh Charlie Sal Kamada Mushtarka Safare, or her uh Katamune Kati the Kas, Inone Ham Sabne Milke, General Surgery, Trauma Surgery, or Minimal Invasive Surgery, Bani Messi, Hai Musu Sapo de Mari Ustad, the Motor and Professor. Because your story is the story of uh, every girl who wants to rise and shine. Uh, coming from Pakistan and uh, adopting the uh, UK as a, uh, as a second home and then finally as a home and then uh, rising to this career to become the first uh, robotic, uh, first female Pakistani surgeon to adopt robotic surgery. It is remarkable. And I really enjoyed your talk. और ये बिल्कुल ये सामने बेता मतलब मैं बेतहाशा तो नहीं कहूंगा लेकिन बहुत सी जो यंग लड़कियां यहां पे बैठी हुई हैं जो अपने करियर पाथवेज को तलाश करने की कोशिश कर रही हैं मेरे ख्याल में अरुज हैज वेरी ब्यूटीफुली एक्सप्लेन यू हाउ टू एक्चुअली राइज टू योर करियर्स एंड व्हाट टू डू इन पाकिस्तान एंड व्हाट टू डू टू गेट टू यूके एंड हाउ व्हाट पाथवेज टू अडॉप्ट इन यूके टू बिकम यू नो टू हाउ टू डू कोर ट्रेनिंग एंड स्पेशलिस्ट ट्रेनिंग गेट अ सीसीएसटी एंड देन become a consultant and come to the position where Aruj is. I told that Aruj is a very young girl, but she's a very pleasant looking, very, uh, with a very uh, uh, nice smile on her face. I think that uh, that is what uh, every girl should uh, become. You should take her lead, you should uh, take her career pathways and should follow that. So Aruj, first of all, I think that you are very sensitive and 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 you are very sensitive आपने जो है ना ये सारा इनके सामने अपना करियर पाथवे रखा इनको सिखाया कि कैसे इस करियर पे चलना है और कैसे मालूम मुमकिन होगा सो दैट्स ग्रेट एंड आई थिंक दैट रोबोटिक सर्जरी ये एक ट्रेडिशन थी हमारे अंदर कि हम हमेशा इट वाज अ मेल डोमिनेटेड प्रोफेशन जो सर्जन्स का प्रोफेशन है हमारे जमाने में तो इक्का दुक्का कहीं कहीं हमें कोई फीमेल सर्जन मिलती थी जिनका नाम प्रोफेसर खालिदा उस्मान जो इस इंस्टीट्यूशन की बहुत बड़ी टीचर भी रही हैं प्रिंसिपल भी रही हैं और uh, मैं समझता हूं कि उन्होंने बड़ा अपना नाम पैदा किया जनरल सर्जरी के अंदर बट उसके अलावा बहुत ही हाल हाल के हिंदुओं में कोई फीमेल सर्जन नजर आया करती थी बट नाउ द प्रोपोर्शन सिंस द प्रोपोर्शन ऑफ 
ladies in the medical profession is growing in the form of uh, undergraduates and postgraduates. So we are finding more and more girls, uh, you know, uh, coming into this profession. And this is actually a very physically demanding uh, profession. But I found, as a robotic surgeon, I found out that that physical demand, that fatigue which we had to do as a as a surgeon, is I'm not saying that it's taken away, but it is minimized. It is minimized in many ways. I, I can discuss it for uh, a lot of time, but I think that it's time to ask uh, Arud uh, questions about robotic surgery. And I would for the first question would be that Arud. Uh, would you recommend uh, these young, uh, you know, shining girls sitting here in this uh, auditorium uh, to become, uh, you know, um, a robotic surgeon? Uh, uh, because I think that uh, me, uh, as an aging surgeon at the age of 63 years, I found it to be very, very comfortable as far as the visualization is concerned, as far as the kinematics is concerned, as far as the ergonomics is concerned. I may have to explain what I mean by these terms. But, you know, it has made surgery uh, with a lot of less fatigue and easy maneuverability and with e better visualization and uh, uh, with better ease of performance uh, surgeries. Ji Aruj, please. Ji, Walaikum Salaam. Thank you so much for your kind words. I'm truly honored to be part of the group here today. And my teacher was very supportive. It was a very challenging journey. Uh, certainly, our Abhi in hindsight, it looks fantastic, but certainly there have been challenges. Like, and I have, alhamdulillah, been very well supported by mentors and my family and friends. And the journey to, you know, hasil karna mushkile. And for certain, you know, I had a lot of blessings of my parents and my family, and they were behind me through this journey. So thank you so much for your kind words, Kay. And I really am humbled to uh, hear those. Um, I hope in the audience, uh, there is a female surgeon out there somewhere who can achieve those aspirations that uh, you might have had in you and you've had you know, people say to you it's not possible, but it is possible. And uh, where you look at role models, where you I can be that person, you get inspiration from that person and you get to move forward and you get to move forward. Because certainly talent ki koi kami nahi hai is audience mein and every single one of you has so much talent, probably more, you know, sure, more than me and you're more brighter and more talented. So uh, there's no reason why I would have to do this thing. With regards to robotic surgery, I am very passionate about it. I see that there's so many advantages, not only for the patient, but for the surgeon as well. Um, that's a very big advantage for your musculoskeletal system. You know, long hours, in awkward positions, leaning over. So there's a lot of advantages from robotic surgery. And the surgery itself, you can use precision surgery, you can break it, you can walk around it. So physically, it is definitely less demanding. Uh, in my department, there are two three surgeons who have been performing open laparoscopic surgeries for 30-40 years and all of them have some form of musculoskeletal issues and when they started their robotic surgery in the department, they had felt, I wish we had done this 30-40 years uh, ago. Um, so certainly, yeah, I would encourage you to consider it. I understand the challenges, financial challenges about having robotic systems in every hospital everywhere. So it's probably not very accessible yet for everybody. But if we as a group say that we're keen on it and we want to drive it forward, or sare, you know, promote Kalishis go to inshallah, I'm sure we would have access to robotic assisted surgery in um, you know most of the hospitals for sure. So I think that I would now encourage um, questions from the audience because there are a pretty young minds sitting over here and I'm sure that they will have a lot of questions uh, for Anuj uh, to answer. So we can, can we give this uh, to the uh, audience the mic? First of all, I want to tell you that you want to become a surgeon. It's so remarkable. ये आपका पहले से फैसला था या रूच की प्रेजेंटेशन देके फैसला किया पहले से फैसला था तो अभी रूच की प्रेजेंटेशन सुनके कितने लोगों ने फैसला किया सो दे सो मेनी ग्रेट 
So, now you have to ask your question because your role model is sitting right in front of this big screen and you can just uh, interact with her and take help. Because, remember that you have said that if you have a person there sitting right in the UK at such a position, she will be in a position to attract so many of you to UK and place you there and uh, you know uh, to, to help you out uh, there and uh, you will help you in different placement and you will help you in different placement and she will make you learn this is very important in this commitment that you will come to this forum and you will talk to us so don't lose this opportunity this is a great opportunity to interact with Aruj exchange your, uh, you know, uh, your emails with her uh, get, uh, get permission for her that you can access her team se baat kar hai. Uh, see her on YouTube how does she work and uh, Ask her, uh, you know, of, uh, of all that. Look, the thing is that we are not waiting for someone to help us. So, it doesn't happen. You have to be able to do this to be able to do this. Yes, it is a need for your need. And you don't do this. You don't do this to be able to do this. You don't do this to be able to do this. You don't do this to be able to do this. You don't do this to be able to do this. You don't do this to be able to do this. So, today, the one who is able to do this, after that, you have to be able to do this. So, let's do this and help you and she will be a great guide to your team. Thank you. Thank you. Ajji, we have time for just one question. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. Ajji, go ahead quickly. The first question is that, we just want to keep confusion and I think you're putting arms there and for the ball. They need the instrument, tools, or the something. I am not clear about. Number two is uh, there are so many advantages of this robotic uh, building. There perhaps might be some disadvantages. I want to listen from you. I want to learn from you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Arush? Dr. Sir, I didn't really hear that very well. I'm sorry. Could you repeat anything, please? First question is that the report is performing the surgery, isn't it? And the tools, the instruments, the retractor, the forceps, the scissors, all these are from where it is supplied. It is the report. Himself is producing it or somebody else. Thank you, sir. I just summarized. We have to move on, sir. For you, that one of the technology comes from where it comes from. And the other thing is that there are no drawbacks in the robotic surgery. Thank you, sir. Yes, so there is one, there are a few systems, robotic systems on the market that are available and they all have different implications and costs. Our main system is a Da Vinci system run by an intuitive company and they have reusable instruments or go pair of Huawei instruments used for support. Drawbacks is mainly the financial outlay, so it's the initial financial cost to have an instrument key and machine key. But over time, because our benefits are so much, the complications are less, the mistakes are less, the recovery is less, so the cost, the initial outlay is of course, the neutralized of your profit margin. So we see the outcast of the other of the initial financial investment had to purchase a system. So, then you have to return to the return. Thank you very much, Aruj. I know that you have to go to the ground in circumstances which are difficult nowadays in the NHS. So, what I'll do is I will ask Professor Gundal, who is our gracious host today, to thank you. And then I will invite Varta to make some comments and give some prizes for the research posters. So, Professor Khalid Masood Bhandar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahman. Thank you, Dr. Thar. I think we had a wonderful session today. Initially, the sessions, they were in the four halls, and all halls, they were full of the audience, and very informative and productive discussion that was going on. And innovative talk by Dr. Ruj. Dr. Ruj, we are very, very grateful to you. I think robotic surgery is a new concept, but the good thing is, Pakistan always follows the word or Pakistan is parallel to the world. I still remember then uh, Philip Mort and I think another person, they did first laparoscopic cholecystectomy. This was in 1989 and 1990. 
The first laparoscopic uh, colostectomy in Pakistan was done in 1991, immediately one year after the world that did. Or Usme, I remember the founder of the laparoscopic colostectomy in Pakistan, Fazlullah Jodhi, my teacher, then Professor Nawaz Sahib here in Fatima Jana, Professor Abdul Majid Jodhi, and Professor Ejaz. The first laparoscopic colostectomy was assisted by Professor Mahmoud Ayaz as the first assistant and myself as the second assistant and we have got a relationship of over four decades. And now with the party signing, I think there is going on the meeting, Dr. Ruth, very nicely mentioned and demonstrated and I am very happy. Professor Mahmoud Ayaz is having the laparoscopy with me in the private sector and we are going to have in 2024 the postgraduate program in the robotic surgery and we will have three centers in Pakistan accredited by the same. The last interesting thing which I wanted to share with Uruj and Dr. Athar too. Because they always talk to the women empowerment and the example of women empowerment at King Abel was that Sarah Afsal and Professor Bilkis Chabi, these were, these were two ladies who were King Abel in all the academic activities. Professor Bilgis Shabir, Professor Nauri Natwal, Professor Shamsa and all the women empowerment is a great example of this. And my own family of women empowerment, which I have been working on my own family, I also practice it. But statistically, I just wanted to share one statistic with you. When it was open merit, the children have more and more. And the children have more and more. They are very good, you are seeing how it is full of these students. If I have found you, it will be fabulous. After open merit, the girls' ratio in the undergraduate was 70% and is 70%. 70 to 30%. But two decades ago, post-graduate, this ratio was 24%. After this, the career counseling seminar and this discussion I think that continued. उस वक्त शायद एक खालदा उस्मानी थी। आज से फिर दस साल पहले ये रेशो बढ़ती 28 तक गई। चार साल पहले इस रेशो बाद 48 परसेंट और एक दिन पहले ये रेशो 59 परसेंट। इस वक्त 50 59 परसेंट। With the college of physicians in Pakistan, we are having 35,000 postgraduate residents, और उनमें से 59 परसेंट our family is half is gynae, pediatrics, or in specialty. Ke alawa, bachiyan kam usko aap karte thi. You now you name the specialty and the leading surgeon and physician. They are the female. Aur ek saal usse doctor Rajiv Sangle. And I am sure aane wale dinon mein wo jo 30 70 ke ratio hai, ye 59 is going to up to the 70 percent. Because this idare we are mojood hai, this idare ki fakality inspired, motivated, aur bachchon ko jaysay train kar rhi hai, kis vakar bhi aap surgical department mein puchhe, surgical ke professor maare dono kino mojood hai, joh surgical department mein is per residency kar rhi hai, mail udhar aad khade kar rhi hai, mail. Aur bachchiyan ke kaar rhi aad khade kar rhi hai. How surgeon and PG are working in the surgical department half the day. Ratio they do. 20 into 80. So, Aruj is a role model for these students. And Professor Mahmood Ajaz is a role model for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khan sir. So, Aruj, thank you very much for being here today. We will let you carry on with your analyst duties. And for a small fee, I will bring back your award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And we should all be back tomorrow. So, uh, as you guys are uh, signing off, I will now uh, invite Varda. Uh, Varda Tarek Shafi, she is an MGI. She currently works in England. Um, and she has two duties to perform. Apart from her many duties, one of them is to give away the prizes uh, for the poster competition for the fourth year FJ students, and then she will say a few words about her uh, current pursuits and her ambitions for FJ. But I think one thing I am grateful to Dr. Agar that today, in this symposium, FJ Avenue's first lecture, the name is given. 
this will be going to a, a regular feature aur ye first hai aur next year will have the second so is andaaz mein this will be a regular feature of fpng international अच्छा आवाज आ गई मुझे मुझे पहुंच गई है बहुत कुछ ही नहीं थी बट थैंक यू वेरी मच आप लोगों को बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आप सबका मोर इम्पोर्टेंटली डॉक्टर गोंदल का एंड दी फैकल्टी ऑफ एफ जिन्होंने हमें एक्चुअली ये प्लेटफॉर्म प्रोवाइड किया कि आज हम यहाँ आके आप सबके सामने बात कर सकें मैं सबसे पहले तो आपको ये बताऊँगी कि मैं मैं ग्रेजुएट हूँ यहाँ पे 1990 की और 89 88 89 90 में आई वाज़ द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ़ द यूनियन उस वक्त उस वक्त उस वक्त हमारी जो दिल में था वो जिसे कहते हैं ना बड़े खाब थे बहुत ड्रीम्स थे कि हम पता नहीं दुनिया बदल के रख देंगे और हुआ यही कि शादी हुई एंड आई लेफ्ट फॉर इंग्लैंड वहाँ पे काम किया पहले एज ए जी उसके बाद मैंने अपनी ट्रेनिंग की ऑक्यूपेशनल मेडिसिन में और फिर ऑक्यूपेशनल मेडिसिन में ही मैं अब काम कर रही हूँ वहाँ पे तो हमेशा एक ख्याल रहता था दिल में कि यार इतना कुछ कर लिया पाकिस्तान के लिए कुछ नहीं किया वहीं पे जाके रह गए वहीं पे जाके बसना शुरू हो गए और अभी दो तीन साल दो ढाई साल पहले की बात है कि डॉक्टर अतर ने अप्रोच किया और उन्होंने कहा कि कैम्प का पाकिस्तान में काम कर रहे हैं तो आप लोग एफ का भी लिंक हमारे साथ मिला और काम करो and i must say thank you to dr atar for providing us with this opportunity ke ab hamara jo uk ka uh, fj group hai that is active aur wo mashallah uh, fj ke liye pakistan ke liye kaam kar raha hai uh, isme jo ek aur bahut bada i think hamare liye uh, milestone tha wo ye tha ke dr gondal sahab ne hame bahut help kiya isme he actually supported us he supported the idea that we could come over and we could start the fj uk chapter in pakistan now going forward main samajhti hu ki hum yahan pe health reforms pe kaam kar rahe hain wahan pe bahut kaam ho raha hai we are bringing in all the information everything over back to pakistan family practice is another thing jiska hamesha se ye lagta hai ki uski yahan pe base us tarah nahi hai pakistan mein jabki bahar jahan अब मैं एग्जांपल इंग्लैंड की दे सकती हूँ वहाँ पे मैं खुद काम करती हूँ कि आपका जो प्राइमरी कनेक्शन है जो आपकी कहीं पे भी आपकी रिपोर्ट है दैट गो बैक टू योर जीपी अच्छा नाउ दैट आई नो इट्स अ फार फेस्ट आइडिया अगर हम इस वक्त ये देखें कि हमारे पास अभी बेसिक ही नहीं है उसका लेकिन मैं सिर्फ आपको बताना चाहती हूँ गोइंग फॉरवर्ड दीज आर द थिंग्स वी आर वर्किंग ऑन कि इसको हम किस तरह आप लोगों के लिए और आसान बनाएं इसको यहाँ पर लेकर आए मगर मोर इम्पॉर्टेंटली इन सब के अलावा जो मेरा एक पैशन है वो ये है कि हम सर्विस यूजर जो कि हमारा पेशेंट है उसके लिए तो हम काम करते हैं उसके लिए हम सब कुछ कर रहे हैं वाई नॉट फॉर द सर्विस प्रोवाइडर जो हम खुद हैं एंड दैट इज वट आई एम डूइंग इन ऑक्यूपेशनल मेडिसिन तो गंगल साहब से मेरी रिक्वेस्ट है कि इस सब्जेक्ट को वो देखें इट इज़ नो वेयर इन पाकिस्तान मैंने यहाँ पे आके उसकी किताब ढूंढने की कोशिश की मुझे वो भी नहीं मिली जबकि ऑक्सफोर्ड हैंड बुक है but i could find it so it is something for us it is for the healthcare providers theek hai and that is where i wish to we can start it aur phir ye hai ki agar ye hamara project theek rehta hai to then it can move on to the other sectors as well so inshallah inshallah we have got some plans and we have got something which we are thinking on and i hope ke aap sab log hamare sath honge to we will be able to implement all of them and um finally i would like to say thank you to everyone jinhone hame ye mauka diya aur uh, inshallah inshallah in future we will try to bring more thank you acha ab hamare paas ye posters aaye the they were about 29 posters ye aap unki i think it's the fourth year uh, community vaccine kendra tha jinhone ye hame 29 posters bheje अब हमने किया ये कि इसमें हमने ये सारे पोस्टर्स वहाँ हमारी जो यू के का जो ग्रुप है हमने उस पर डाल दिए और हमने उनको कहा कि जी आप इसको रेट करें सो वी फाइनली गॉट फाइव टॉप पोस्टर्स और फिर आज हमारे जजेस ने उन टॉप फाइव पोस्टर्स के ओरल प्रेजेंटेशन थी जिसके बाद उनमें से थ्री सेलेक्ट किए तो मैं शुड आई गो फ्रॉम 
Right. The third position, can I announce now? Is that okay? Right. So the third position goes to prevalence of depression and associated factors in adolescent students of Lahore. There is a small cash prize as well, so I'll just go and Assessment of knowledge and practice of healthcare workers towards hospital waste management among Sir Gangaram Hospital. the first position with the post goes to the assessment of birth prepar uh, preparedness among pregnant women in tertiary care hospital law. poster competition we have today. It's Dr. Sadia, Dr. Sadok, uh, Dr. Daniel, and Dr. Kabila. Thank you very much for your Thank you very much. So these were the cash prizes and uh, there are a few more certificate prizes as well for the poster competition. There were two categories, health education and research. So in the health education category, the third position goes to Dr. Namra Javed, the title was Strategy for Reducing Infant Mortality. <laughs> the second position goes to Dr. Harim Fatima. The title was Be a Fighter, Choose Life. Dr. Ikra Zer, uh, Zerlesh of Vidi, and her title was Unsafe Childhood Today, Vulnerable Adult Tomorrow. Video uh, on health hand washing, and the winner is the group. The group leader is Dr. Mariam Safta. <laughs> so, in the research category, the third position goes to Dr. Kuradulan. And the topic was assessment of knowledge and practices of healthcare workers to uh, towards hospital based management at Sagaram Hospital. The second position goes to Dr. Rufeda Ishaq and the topic is sexual and reproductive health communication between mothers and adolescent daughters, 13 to 19 years.
And the winner in this category is Dr. Namra Javed again. And the topic is prevalence of musculoskeletal disorder among surgeons in tertiary care hospitals. My apologies, I forgot to say one thing. We had 29 posters. Top three got the top three prizes, but we, um, FJ uh, UK, they have arranged small cash prizes for the rest of the 26 bodies. Uh, Medical University at that time. So, it's a Universal Healthcare. So, we have 
کہ جتنے بھی پاکستان کے شہری ہیں چاہے وہ شہر میں ہوں یا دیہات میں ہوں چاہے وہ امیر ہوں یا غریب ہوں کوئی بھی ان کا مذہب ہو کوئی بھی ان کی ایتھنیسٹی ہو سب کو ہیلتھ کیئر اس طریقے سے ملے کہ جو کسی کوالٹی اچھی ہو اور یا تو مفت ہو یا اتنی اس کی قیمت ہو کہ وہ افورڈیبل ہو تو آپ کو شاید یہ اندازہ ہوگا کہ آئی ایم شیور آپ دیکھتے ہوں گے جو سینز آف ڈیپریویشن ہیں پاورٹی کے اور ہیلپ لیسنس کے گنگا رام میں بھی اور ہم نے کئی کے بھی دیکھے ہیں پاکستان میں وہ روٹین ہے رادر دین ایکسپشن ایک اور روٹین یہ ہے کہ جو کالیگز ہیں ہمارے ینگ ڈاکٹر اسپیشلی وہ جب فیس کر رہے ہوتے ہیں مریض کو تو سفرنگ کو دیکھنا بڑا مشکل ہوتا ہے تو وہ لوگ نہ صرف اپنا مریضوں کا علاج کرتے ہیں بلکہ ذاتی طور پر ان کی مالی طور پہ بھی ہیلپ کرتے ہیں مجھے یاد ہے کہ کے ای میں ایک آرگنائزیشن تھی فور بلڈ ڈونیشن یہاں پہ بھی ایک پیشنٹ ویلفیئر سوسائٹی ہے تو میں نے گنگا رام میں کافی سے کام کیا ہے انگلینڈ جانے سے پہلے اور آئی واز سو پراؤڈ آف مائی ڈیلی ڈاکٹر کالکس کہ جو کہ محنت کرتی تھی دن رات جاگتی تھی مریضوں کا علاج کرتی تھی جب انہیں ضرورت پڑتی تھی بلڈ ڈونیشن کی وہ بھی دیتی تھی اور اگر اچھی آؤٹ کم نہیں ہوتی تھی بیٹھ کے روتی بھی تھی سو لیکن میرا خیال ہے کہ اس اینرجی کو اور اس کنسرن کو اور سینٹیمنٹ کو چینلائز کرنے کی ضرورت ہے اور مسئلہ یہ ہے کہ جن لوگوں کو ضرورت ہے سب سے زیادہ ہیلپ کی دے نیڈ ٹو بی ہرڈ ان کی ہمیں باتیں سننے کی ضرورت ہے ہم لوگوں سے مراد یہ کہ وہ لوگ جو کہ پالیسی میکرز ہیں جو کہ عزت دار لوگ ہیں جو کہ سیاستدان ہیں یا حکومت کی اقتدار میں کسی نہ کسی ریسپانسبل پوزیشن میں ہیں ان لوگوں تک ایک غریب اور بے سہارا اور بے زبان لوگوں کی رسائی نہیں ہے سو پیپل ہو نیٹ ٹو بی ہرڈ موسٹ ڈو ناٹ ہیو اے وائس سو یو ہیو ٹو بیکم دیئر وائس اینڈ دیٹ از مائی اونلی میسج اور ہوپ فلی ول کنٹینیو دس اوور دا ایئرس اینڈ ہوپ فلی ود دس یگ جنریشن کمنگ فارورڈ ول میک گریٹ پروگرس تھینک یو Now I request for the souvenir presentation, I request sir to please uh, come forward. <laughs> and we would like to present the souvenir to our honorable chief guest, Professor Mahmoud Ayaz. I would now like to request Professor Khalid uh, Rasul Gundal, sir, please uh, present the shield to Dr. Akhir Sayyid. With this, we finally conclude today's session and thank you very much for being so patient and attending this session. Thank you very much. And I, I would like to request the faculty to please come to the front lawn. And all the dear guests to kindly uh, come to the council room, the faculty in the front lawn, and 